While on a date night, Kevin confessed to Lily that a quest to reach the upper realm had hit a dead end, and Lily gave him the same advice as the Night King, that all he needs to do is clear his mind and allow the answers to come naturally. After dinner, they went to a revival movie theater to see King Kong, but before they could enter, they were hounded down by a journalist who grilled Lily on Chicago's rat problem. Lily struggled to summon an answer, but luckily Ruby Kincaid stepped out of the crowd and gave the journalist a satisfactory answer. Lily was delighted to see her, but Kevin wondered if Ruby might be following them. This seems too fishy to be a coincidence, Kevin thought to himself. When he had brought his suspicions to Lily earlier that day, she dismissed them and told him not to worry, so Kevin decided to hold his tongue on the matter, at least for now. He didn't have much time to think, though, because before he knew it, Lily was introducing him to Ruby. Ruby, this is my husband, Kevin, she said. Ruby smiled widely as she politely shook Kevin's hand. Oh, yes, no introduction needed, she said. I'm a big fan of all you've done for Chicago, Mr. Williams. For decades, some in your family were nothing but trouble, hoarding up money and resources just for themselves, but you're a real working-class hero type, aren't you, Kevin? Why, at this point, I've lost count of how many times you've saved the city. Her words were flattering to him personally, but Kevin sensed a bit of malice and sarcasm behind them. Nonetheless, he played along and acted politely. I've loved this city since the day I was born, Ruby. When it comes to helping it, there's no length I won't go to. Lily told me you're her new chief of staff, so I assume you feel the same way. Ruby nodded. Yes, the city may have its ups and downs, but to me, it'll always be the greatest city in the world. I can't wait to see all the incredible things our new mayor is sure to achieve. As they reached a pause in the conversation, Kevin tried to restrain himself, but couldn't help but ask. Hey, Ruby, I think I recognize your face, actually. Any chance you were at the airport yesterday? Lily turned to Kevin and frowned, but Ruby answered his question all the same. Why, yes, actually. As it happened, I was picking up a friend. I believe I caught a glimpse of you as well. Small world, isn't it? Just then, a loud, angry voice called out from behind. Hey, what's going on up there? You're holding up the line. The show is about to start. When Kevin looked back, he saw that the line behind them had begun to stretch all the way around the block. Are you going to make us wait forever? Another one shouted. Before they knew it, the crowd was boiling with rage. Someone near the front pointed at Lily and said, Why do you think you can hold up a line? You sure don't look like anyone that important to me. Lily's heart started to race as panic welled up with her. No, no, we would never do something like that. There's plenty of room for everyone. Kevin took a step forward and proudly declared, Please forgive us. We got caught up in a conversation and knew we were being rude. In fact, your tickets are on us tonight, ladies and gentlemen, plus as much popcorn and candy as you can eat. As the crowd started to cheer, he turned to the clerk behind the ticket window and handed her his credit card. Here's my credit card, he said. Whatever people want, just put it on my tab. Suddenly, the man with the loud voice realized who he'd been yelling at. Oh my gosh, that's Kevin Williams and his wife Lily, the new mayor. Another patron chimed in. I thought he was a homeless person. I know it's nice to be comfortable, but I would at least put on some better clothes to go to the movies. A third customer shushed both of them. Lily Williams is going to do as much for this city as Kevin Williams has done. Just because we had to wait 45 seconds to get into a movie theater to see a 90-year-old movie isn't going to bother me. Before going into the theater, Ruby turned to Lily and winked. They're going to love you, Mayor Williams. Keep it up and you'll go down as a hero. As they followed her into the theater, Kevin and Lily could hear the crowd murmuring with excitement behind them. Wow, now that's something you don't see every day, do you? Said one. I was skeptical of Mayor Williams at first, but maybe she cares about normal people, said another. Finally, before the doors closed behind them, they heard another one say, A night out to the movies isn't cheap for me and my family, so now we can put the money we would have spent here towards next week's groceries. It was like a chorus of affection, and Lily was delighted to hear it. Before the movie started, though, Lily needed to have another word with Kevin. As they took their seat, she quietly asked, Did you really have to ask Ruby if she was at the airport yesterday? You sounded like you were interrogating her. Kevin sighed. He knew this was coming. I'm sorry, Lily. I just had to know what she was doing there. 
She said she was there to pick up a friend, but when I saw her, she had most of her face covered up, like she was trying to disguise herself or something. If she was really there to pick up a friend, why would she go to such great lengths to cover up her face like that? Wouldn't she want her friend to be able to pick her out of a crowd? Before answering, Lily looked around to make sure Ruby wasn't sitting anywhere nearby. She didn't see her anywhere and assumed she was probably still in the lobby. Kevin, would you please stop acting so paranoid? I know we have to be mindful of our enemies, but Ruby has been a servant of the city for her entire career. For the last time, there's nothing to worry about. Kevin's gut was still telling him something was off about Ruby, but he couldn't argue with Lily's point of view. You're right, he said. It's not fair of me to intrude on your work like this. You hire whoever you want, Lily. But promise me to always keep an eye out for danger, all right? Like I said, being a public figure, especially a political one, comes with a bit of risk. Lily nodded her understanding. I know, Kevin. I know your priority is keeping me and the twins safe. I would never do anything that would make that situation more complicated. Just then, the lights dimmed and the crowd went wild as the opening credits began flickering onto the screen. Kevin and Lily were just below the projector so they could hear it ticking above them. Kevin had wanted to see King Kong on the big screen ever since he was a kid and was worried the experience might not live up to his high expectations. But as the movie progressed, he was thrilled to see that it still held up on every level. Wow, Kevin thought to himself. Everything about it was so ahead of its time. The music, the effects, the deep underlying themes. It truly is a masterpiece. As the movie reached its climactic third act, Kevin was completely immersed in the adventure. King Kong had climbed to the top of the Empire State Building and now the Air Force was trying to take him down. As quietly as she could, Lily leaned over and whispered, how in the world did they manage to pull off these effects way back in 1933? While working on Chains of Desire, Kevin had learned from his cinematographer Levi Stradling how it was done and he couldn't wait to share it with Lily. It's an incredible process, actually, he whispered back to her. What they did was overlap different layers of film that had been shot completely separately. So one day they shot the footage of King Kong, a miniature puppet, and another day they shot footage of the New York skyline to serve as a background. And when you add them together, you get this. Pretty incredible, right? Just then, a light bulb went off in Kevin's head that was so exciting he couldn't help but jump out of his seat. That's it, he yelled. I finally have the answer. While he was standing, the top of Kevin's head poked up into the projector's light and cast a shadow onto the screen. Hey, you're blocking the projector, someone yelled. Another movie patron quieted the man. Kevin Williams just bought you popcorn and milk duds. He can block the screen for as many seconds as he wants to. With a strong tug, Lily grabbed Kevin's arm and pulled him back into his seat. What just happened? She asked. Did a light bulb go off in your head? Kevin nodded with an excited grin on his face. I can't believe I didn't figure it out sooner. That Lumiere Brothers film reel I watched must have just been one piece of the puzzle. That's why it looked incomplete because there are other layers of the film I need to find in order to see the whole movie. There must be other Lumiere films out there. Lily smiled. See? I told you you'd figure it out eventually. With newfound enthusiasm, Kevin looked back at the screen and whispered, Thanks, King Kong. While watching King Kong, Kevin had an epiphany. As he explained the movie's special effects to Lily, he realized that the Lumiere Brothers reel he watched with Lucia was most likely one of several pieces of film that needed to be projected together. And if he wanted to see the true version of the film, he'd have to hunt down the other missing pieces. Before the movie even ended, Kevin shuffled out of his seat and went looking for the projection booth. Easily accessible from the second floor, it wasn't hard to find, and because Kevin felt the matter was urgent, he decided to just let himself in. Inside, the projectionist was sitting right beside the projector, getting ready to splice in a new segment of film at just the right time. He was a young-looking guy with shaggy black hair, and when he heard someone coming, he looked over his shoulder and said, Hey, who's that? You can't be in here, you know. 
Kevin apologized immediately. I'm sorry, he said. It's just that I have a very important question for you. I promise I'll make it fast and then I'll get out of here. The trash can is over there. And could you sweep up later tonight? This place is getting dusty, the projectionist said. Kevin realized that he was mistaking him for the theater's janitor. Kevin had learned not to give normal people who underestimated him a hard time, so he just went ahead with his mission. I wanted to ask you a bit about the old projecting process of running multiple strips of film at the same time. The high level of the subject matter surprised the projectionist who looked up from his work. When he got a good look at Kevin's face and realized who he was talking to, the projectionist's attitude changed in an instant. Wait, wait a second, you're Kevin Williams, aren't you? Holy smokes, man. You're the one everybody's been talking about lately. I gotta say, I thought Chains of Desire was an incredible film. It was the exact kind of shakeup the industry needed. Kevin smiled politely. Thanks for saying that. The projectionist stuck out his hand to shake Kevin's. Call me Gilmer, Kevin continued. Thanks, Gilmer. It means a lot. Anyway, I was wondering if you could tell me how different roles of film were combined to make these special effects in King Kong. I'm restoring an old piece of film and need to know how many layers these special effects shots usually had. Gilmer took a deep breath and stroked his beard. Well, I hate to break it to you, Mr. Williams, but once the layers have been sealed, it's impossible to know how many there were in total. For something like King Kong, there'd have to be at least two, but back in the day, filmmakers used to combine as many as five or six layers of film on top of one another. I think Fritz Lang was said to have used as many as 12. Kevin gulped. The idea of having to track down 12 different layers of the film worried him. Getting to the upper realm had been a long quest and he knew time was running out. 12? He asked nervously. Gilmer nodded. Yes, but that's an extreme example. I'd say on average most filmmakers used only two or three layers at a time. Kevin scratched his chin and thought. What about the Lumiere brothers? He asked. Any idea how many layers they might have used? Gilmer sat, leaned back in his chair and shrugged. It's difficult to say. The Lumiere brothers were wildly inventive filmmakers, so it wouldn't surprise me if they had some pretty high numbers. Maybe you could learn more from a film historian. I'm more into the creative side of things, you know. Kevin thanked the projectionist with a handshake. Well, at least it's a place to start. Thanks for your help, friend. I appreciate you letting me back here. Gilmer shook Kevin's hand with gusto. Oh, of course, Mr. Williams, please. You're welcome anytime. Before you go, though, I was wondering if you might listen to a few movie pitches of mine. I actually happen to be an aspiring screenwriter, and I know you're soon going to be the most important man in Hollywood. Inwardly, Kevin squirmed at the idea, but not wanting to be rude, he smiled and said, Sure, I've got time for maybe just one. What have you got? Suddenly, under the most pressured he'd ever experienced in his life, Gilmer collected his thoughts and took a deep breath. Okay, imagine this. It's about this guy who discovers a portal to the future. And what he finds is that the world has completely flooded and dolphins now rule the earth. Now, stay with me here. At first, he's horrified, but over time, he comes to sympathize with dolphins and even joins them in a sort of dances with wolves kind of way. I call it Dolphin Apocalypse. What do you think? Kevin didn't know what to say. He didn't want to discourage the young projectionist, so after a long pause, he simply said, Sounds riveting. You should really get in touch with an agent about that. Gilmer tried to get Kevin to put him in touch with someone, but Kevin evaded the request by saying he had to get back to catch the end of the movie. Kevin thought the pitch sounded offbeat, even weird, but he recalled the waitress at the Beverly Hills Hotel, Selenium, who professed herself as an idea girl. He wondered what she would think of the idea and made a mental note to contact her on returning to Hollywood. After the movie, Kevin and Lily got in the car and drove back to their estate in the suburbs. That night, Kevin was so thrilled he could hardly sleep. Just as the Night King had said, the answer revealed itself when the time was ready. And Kevin was eager to get back to Hollywood and begin searching for the other missing pieces of the Lumiere Brothers film reel. Look out, Upper Realm. I'm coming for you. Kevin thought just as he was falling asleep. The next morning, Kevin wanted to talk with Lily about returning to Hollywood, but she was already out the door by the time he woke up. Stumbling into the living room in his pajamas, he saw Dorothy brewing some coffee and asked, Hey, where did Lily go? City Hall? Surprised that he had to ask, Dorothy scoffed. 
She's the mayor of Chicago now, Kevin. Of course she went to City Hall. She's got important business to do unlike you. Today is her first big meeting with the leaders from every department of the city, didn't you know? Transportation, energy, education, the chief of police, and a few members of the city council. It's a big deal. Kevin couldn't leave without saying goodbye to Lily, so he decided to wait at least until she got back. She's going to crush it, he said. Lily's going to get more work done in six months than the last mayor got done in six years. That sounds stressful, though I know she can handle it. She has to stay calm for the babies, you know. Or did you forget about them? Dorothy spat out at Kevin. Of course not, Dorothy. Lily and the babies are the most important thing in my life. The babies and Lily, he replied meaningfully. Meanwhile, across town, the meeting was just getting started. The group was gathered in the largest conference center in City Hall attached directly to the mayor's office. As soon as the clock struck three, Lily cleared her throat and the other city coordinators quieted down. All right, she said. We have a bumpy road in front of us, but I know that each and every one of you is the exact right person for the job. Together, we can combine our efforts and turn Chicago into the most thriving city in America. Lily was about to continue, but the chief director of sanitation, Edwin Hartford, a balding man in his late 60s, interjected and cut her off. Let's skip past the nicety, shall we, Mayor? I think the real question on everyone's mind is what on earth you're going to do about this rat problem of ours. I mean, it's downright out of control at this point, wouldn't you agree? Just last week, someone had to shoot one because it was going after his kid. Now, I'm no PR expert, but I wouldn't say that's a good look for the city. Lily sighed. Under her breath, she murmured, Bringing up the rat crisis already, are we? Let's get on with it then. Lily looked up at the man seated across the room and gestured for him to stand. To speak on the rat crisis, I've invited our chief overseer from the animal control unit, Alvin Zabrowski. Give us a rundown of the situation, Alvin. Alvin stood up and nervously clutched his wrist as he answered. Uh, well, frankly, ma'am, it's not very good. Not only are these rats abnormally large, but they're also unusually aggressive. None of the animal control guys will go anywhere near them, and for good reason. They look like they could bite your head off. Lily rubbed her forehead. She was starting to get a headache. Thanks, Alvin. So you're telling me you don't have any solutions? Edwin Hartford, who fancied himself a real fast and loose kind of politician, interjected and answered for him. I'll tell you what we need to do. We need to gas the life out of them, drop a few poison gas grenades into the sewers, and voila! No more giant rats. Lily shook her head. Don't be silly, Mr. Hartford. We can't just unleash a cloud of poison below the city. Who knows what kind of side effects that might have? It could get into our drinking water or seep through our plumbing. With a stern look on his face, Edwin raised a finger at Lily and said, You wouldn't have lasted a second in Vietnam. Just then, Ruby threw her fist down on the table and got everyone's attention. Now, Mr. Hartford, that is no way to speak to your new mayor, and you know it. I won't allow you to bust her chops like that while I'm around. Listen up, everyone. Chicago has faced far worse threats than a couple of mangy rats. The mayor just needs a few days to absorb what she's learned today, and we'll have a solution for you in no time, won't we, mayor? Lily was slightly shocked at Ruby's outburst, but she straightened her back and nodded in agreement. That's right. I just need to consult a few experts to survey what kind of options we have. By the end of next week, the rat crisis will be just a memory. Edwin scoffed. If that's true, Mayor, I'll eat every last one of my words. Lily smiled, but all of a sudden she felt incredibly nervous. She had boldly made a promise in front of all of them her new peers and co-workers, and now she had to actually follow through. If I don't make good on this promise, she thought, they'll never take me seriously again. I can't have anything undermine the name and reputation Kevin has worked so hard to establish in this city. Kevin went upstairs and spoke with the projectionist to confirm his suspicion that he needed to find multiple strips of film. Meanwhile, Lily was attending her first city council meeting. 
and the topic on everyone's mind was the issue of giant rats. Under pressure to provide a solution, Lily promised that the rats would be taken care of before the end of the week, but deep down she had no idea how she was going to do it. During the car ride home, Lily was full of anxiety. What have I gotten myself into? She thought to herself. If I don't do something about these rats, there's no way I'll ever win a second election. I have to get rid of them fast, but I don't even know where to start. When she got home and stepped inside, Lily saw Kevin working up a sweat in the kitchen. Hey, Kevin, that's sweet of you to make dinner, she said. Kevin looked over his shoulder and smiled for just a moment before fixing his eyes back on the stove. He was in the middle of cooking a vegetable stir-fry, which called for his full attention, but he would risk having less than crisp pea pods to speak with his beloved wife. It's the least I could do while I'm just relaxing at home, he said. How was your big city council meeting? He added. Lily took a seat in front of the counter and sighed. Well, to be honest with you, Kev, it was a bit of a mess. Have you heard about these giant rats terrorizing the city? I haven't seen one myself, but apparently they're getting to be the size of bowling balls. Kevin looked up with a surprised expression on his face. Giant rats, huh? That's strange. I haven't seen one either. I don't think they've made it out to the suburbs yet, Lily replied. But in the city, it's a huge problem. The animal control unit told me they were unusually aggressive, too. Just then, Kevin started connecting the dots in his head. Hang on a minute. Oversized? Unusually aggressive? I've dealt with this kind of thing before. Do you remember back when the Mavericks were experimenting with genetically modified corn that could turn people into super soldiers? Well, if I had to guess, I'd say it sounds like these rats probably got into some, too. The thought gave Lily goosebumps. Well, that's not exactly the most comforting idea in the world. No matter what caused it, I have to do something about it, Kevin. I made a promise in front of everyone that the rat issue would be solved by the end of next week. I don't know what I was thinking. I just tensed up and told everyone what I thought they wanted to hear, but the truth is, I have no idea where to even begin with this. Sensing Lily's nervous energy, Kevin turned down the stove, walked over to her, and started rubbing her back. Don't worry, honey. We'll figure this out together. We faced impossible odds before, but somehow we always pull through, remember? Lily took a deep breath and relaxed her shoulders. Kevin's support always made her feel at ease. You're right, she said with newfound confidence. We'll figure this out like we always do. Any ideas? Kevin nodded. As soon as Lily mentioned the problem, his brain quickly started to hatch up a solution. I think the problem might be easier to fix than you think, he said. Ever since I went on my vision quest in the Amazon, I've been able to communicate with the animal kingdom. Maybe the rats can be reasoned with. Lily nervously clutched her wrist. Gee, I don't know, Kevin. The way people talk about these things makes them sound pretty dangerous. Are you sure it's worth the risk? Kevin nodded. At least give me a chance to investigate the situation, he said. If we can deal with the rats without hurting them, that would probably be best, right? Lily nodded. Yes, the last thing I want to do is unleash a bunch of poison to exterminate them. That would endanger the entire city, not to mention be extremely cruel. Just promise me this, Kevin. When you go into the sewers, bring an exterminator with you just in case, all right? If it comes down to it, I'd rather the rats get hurt than you. Because he was a level 7 fighter, Kevin knew he didn't really need an exterminator to tag along with him. But to put Lily's mind at ease, he agreed to it anyway. No problem, he said. I'll get in touch with someone right away and we can head down into the sewers first thing in the morning. Lily smiled and kissed Kevin's cheek. Thanks, Kevin. You're the best first husband a mayor like me could ever have. Kevin chuckled as he returned to the stove to keep cooking. At your service, my lady he said with a playful grin. The next morning, Lily returned to City Hall and Kevin went out to meet the exterminator. His name was Jackson Crow and according to internet reviews, he was the best exterminator in Chicago. When Kevin parked and stepped inside the store, Jackson looked up from behind the counter and said, Ah, you must be Kevin, ready to hunt down some giant rats? Kevin smirked, ready as I'll ever be. Thanks for agreeing to this, Mr. Crow. Hopefully the job will be nice and simple. 
Jackson chuckled as he stepped around the corner. He was wearing a navy blue boiler suit and his hair was long, curly, and a little oily. Please, call me Jackson, he said. Mr. Crow is my father's name. Before we get going, though, I gotta tell you, Kevin, I'm a huge movie buff and I thought your film Chains of Desire was amazing. I've actually got a few movie ideas myself if you'd like to hear them. Kevin grimaced. The last thing he wanted to hear right now was another person's movie pitch. Let's stay focused on the rats. Maybe we can talk about your movie ideas if we have time later. Sound like a deal? Jackson nodded. Sounds good to me, boss. My van is right outside. Let's get going. Parked outside, there was a big green van with crow extermination painted on the side. After Kevin got in the passenger seat, Jackson got behind the wheel and started driving a few blocks down the road. The old commercial district is where the rat problem is at its worst. What do you say? Do you want to head straight into the lion's den? Or the rat's den, I guess, Jackson asked. Kevin shrugged. Well, I want to see the full extent of the problem, so yeah, that sounds good. Along the way, Jackson talked Kevin's ear off about movies and the current state of the film industry. He was very opinionated, but they could at least agree that superhero movies had overstayed their welcome. Finally, they reached the heart of the old commercial district and parked right beside a manhole leading into the sewers. Working together, they lifted the heavy manhole cover and gazed into the darkness below. The sunlight only reached a few feet inside before disappearing into pure darkness. Ready to get down there and explore the depths? Jackson asked. Kevin nodded. Let's see what we're dealing with. Then he took a deep breath and started climbing down into the darkness. As they climbed deeper and deeper, Kevin started to hear the faint sound of running water below them. When they finally reached the bottom, Jackson took out his flashlight and shone it around, revealing a dank tunnel system that twisted in turn like an underground hedge maze. Kevin plugged his nose and nearly gagged. Gosh, it smells terrible down here, he said. Disturbed, Jackson put his hands on his hips and smiled. It'll grow on you, he replied. I couldn't stand the smell when I first came down here either, but now I feel right at home. Kevin shuddered at the thought. Then, for the next 20 minutes or so, Kevin and Jackson walked through the underground tunnel system until Kevin suddenly stopped and held up his hand. Hold on a second. Do you hear that? He asked. When Jackson stopped moving, he suddenly heard it too. I know that sound anywhere, Jackson said. We've got company just ahead. On your guard. When Kevin and Jackson turned a corner right before them, they spotted a group of rats skittering along the floor. There were so many of them that it was impossible to count. They don't look much bigger than normal sewer rats, Kevin remarked. Technically, these look like muroid rodents originated in Eurasia, most likely genus Bandicoda bengelenesis, Jackson said. They have a distinctive molar pattern of three rows of teeth instead of two. Don't forget about the unusually aggressive part. Kevin took a step forward and held out his hand in front of one of the rats. Hey there, little fella. I'm not going to hurt you, he said. I just want to talk and see how we might be able to help each other. Jackson raised his eyebrows at Kevin's chatty way with the rats. Normally, when Kevin tried to communicate with animals, they would take an immediate liking to him, but these rats seemed disturbed by his presence. As soon as his finger touched one of them, they all began to squeal and scurry away down the corner. Moving together as one, they almost looked like a river. I don't understand, Kevin said. It's like they want nothing to do with me. Jackson shrugged his shoulders. Well, rats tend to be pretty antisocial creatures, Kevin. I wouldn't take it personally. But Kevin wasn't ready to give up just yet. Come on, let's follow them, he said. I want to try again. As Kevin and Jackson turned around the next corner, they heard loud, heavy footsteps that didn't sound like a rat. You hear that? Jackson asked. Those footsteps sound quite a bit heavier. Just then, two enormous rats turned around a corner and hissed at them. Kevin's eyes widened with shock when he saw them. True to the rumors, each of them was as big as a hound. Well, Kevin sighed, I think we found our problem. Before Jackson could say anything, the two giant rats started rushing towards them. Oh God, Jackson screamed, they're on the attack. Instead of panicking though, Kevin took a deep breath and prepared for battle. 
Although he was eager to get back to Hollywood and search for more Lumiere Brothers film reels, Kevin decided to stay in Chicago to help Lily solve the problem of giant rats terrorizing the city. Relying on his ability to communicate with animals, Kevin wanted to try making peace with the rats before resorting to violence. So he and an exterminator named Jackson went into the sewers to assess the situation. When they finally found a group of rats, Kevin was surprised to see they were normal-sized. Unfortunately, his attempt to communicate with them only scared them away, attracting the attention of two other rats who were, indeed, the size of dogs. Snapping their huge yellow teeth, the rats scurried toward Kevin and Jackson with savage ferocity in their eyes. Get back, Kevin shouted at Jackson. I'll protect you. Then, with a sudden burst of speed, the first rat lunged forward at Kevin, claws poised at his throat. Thanks to his lightning-fast reflexes, Kevin quickly sidestepped the attack and knocked the rat back with a swift kick to the stomach. Undeterred, however, the resilient rodent circled back for another strike. Meanwhile, Jackson nervously clutched at his collar. Just say the word and I'll hit them with poison, boss. On his back, Jackson wore a small tank filled with liquid poison with a nozzle to spray it with. He held the nozzle up at the ready, but Kevin turned back and shouted, No, Jackson, don't use any poison. There's nowhere for the air to ventilate down here and we could breathe it in. Jackson had a gas mask for himself attached to his utility belt, but had completely forgotten to bring one for Kevin. After cursing under his breath, Jackson looked up and saw another giant rat trying to sneak up on Kevin. Behind you, he yelled. Just then, the giant rat launched a surprise attack from the side. Kevin, caught off guard, fell to the ground and started grappling with the rodents, struggling to fend off their bites and their ferocious claw strikes. As they snapped their teeth only inches away from his face, Kevin tried to communicate with them, but to no avail. Please, just listen to me, he pleaded in vain. We don't have to be enemies. When he realized they weren't listening, Kevin had no choice but to fight. With a well-timed swing, he sent one rat tumbling down a pit into a pool of sewage water below. However, the other rat seized the opportunity and sunk its sharp teeth into Kevin's leg. After letting out a cry of pain, Kevin kicked the persistent rat away and had finally retreated into the murky shadows. As soon as the coast was clear, Jackson ran up to Kevin and knelt beside him. Kevin, are you all right? He asked with a worried look on his face. That bite looked pretty nasty. Because adrenaline was still coursing through his veins, Kevin didn't feel much pain, but the bite looked like it was a deep one. Trickles of blood were oozing down his leg and the nerves around the bite were throbbing. Always prepared for something like this, Kevin reached into his satchel and took a recovery pill. That should help speed up the recovery, he said, but we still need to get out of here before it gets infected. Just then, Kevin and Jackson heard a high-pitched squeak and saw a normal-sized rat skittering towards them. Armed with rubber gloves, Jackson scooped it up before it came anywhere near Kevin and examined it for a closer look. As Jackson studied the rat, Kevin crawled up to his feet and said, Well, at least not all of them are giant-sized, right? I wouldn't be so sure about that, Jackson replied. All of a sudden, his eyes were wide with shock. These aren't normal-sized rats, Kevin. They're oversized babies. I couldn't see it before, but now that I'm looking at one up close, it's clear they don't have their adult teeth yet. He's only got one row of molars. These rats are juveniles, and we must have seen about a hundred of them before, right? More, I'd say, Kevin observed. Jackson let the baby rat go and it scurried away into the darkness. If we don't do something about this, we're going to have a serious problem on our hands. Jackson said in a deadly serious tone. Do you realize how fast these things multiply? Before long, they'll outnumber us a thousand to one, and then ten thousand to one. And then what will we do? Right now, we just need to focus on one step at a time, Kevin said. We won't be able to do anything at all unless we get out of here first. You do remember the way, right? Jackson nodded. I know these sewers like the back of my hand, he said. Come with me, there's a shortcut up ahead. Following Jackson's lead, Kevin was guided down the tunnel until they arrived in a great big open chamber where dozens of tunnels converged, spilling their water into a deep pool at the bottom. Much to Kevin's surprise, this part of the sewers was almost beautiful, like an underground palace with dozens of waterfalls. 
Where are we? Kevin asked with a bit of astonishment in his voice. This is the city's main overflow chamber. It's like the Grand Central Station of the underground world, Jackson replied. Surrounding the pool at the bottom, there was plenty of space to stand, and as Kevin walked around, he saw a small plaque engraved into the wall that read, Capone and Kincaid Construction Established 1925 in Faded Lettering. What's this? Kevin asked. Without even looking, Jackson knew what Kevin was talking about. Yeah, I've seen that. One of Al Capone's old companies, they helped build these tunnels, and during the Prohibition era, Capone and his associates used this place to smuggle liquor barrels into the city. As I said, this chamber we're in is at the center of everything. From here, you can get just about anywhere without ever stepping foot above ground. I know Al Capone, Kevin said, but who's this Kincaid fellow? That name is familiar. Jackson shrugged. Probably another gangster at Al Capone's command, he said. There were a lot of them back then. Just then, the answer hit Kevin like a ton of bricks. Kincaid, Ruby Kincaid, Lily's new chief of staff, he thought to himself. Is it possible that her family was tied to Al Capone and the mafia back in the 20s? Everywhere I look, this Ruby woman gets more and more suspicious. Kevin didn't feel the need to share this information with Jackson, so instead he turned to him and said, We should really get going so I can get herbs to treat my wound before it becomes infected. You said the exit was just ahead? Jackson nodded. Follow me, he said. There's a ladder up here to the left. When he reached the top of the ladder, Jackson pushed up on a manhole and re-emerged on the streets. Kevin was right behind him, thankful to finally see the light of day again. The van was right where they left it, parked on the curb. Just as Kevin was about to get in the passenger seat, he suddenly heard a voice yell out from a nearby alleyway. Oh, God, not another one. You're lucky I don't have a shotgun. Kevin instantly put together what the person was talking about and rushed down the alleyway. Come on, Jackson, it sounds like someone's in trouble. Following the sound of loud squeaks, Kevin saw another giant rat nibbling on some trash outside of a dumpster. By then, the frightened passerby had already fled. With a closer look, Kevin saw that the rat was finishing up the last bite of a pizza. When Jackson caught up to him, he asked, You're not going to try to commune with one of those things again, are you? Actually, that was exactly what Kevin was thinking of doing. Look, he said, this one is so distracted with its food that it hasn't attacked us yet. Maybe now is the perfect time to try it. Jackson sighed and took a step back. All right, he said, but I'm putting 911 on speed dial. Very slowly, so as not to startle the rat, Kevin reached out his hand and began to stroke the rat's back. As soon as his fingers touched its fur, a cyclone of thought sprang into his head. But it was just one word, joyously repeating itself over and over again. Pizza! 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 When Kevin started to chuckle, Jackson became very curious. Well, are you two communicating? He asked. What's he saying to you? He seems to really like pizza, Kevin replied. Then the rat did something that astonished him. After devouring the very last bite of pizza, the rat didn't stop there and continued to consume the old pizza box as well. Kevin was fascinated. Hmm, is it possible that the mutation made their stomachs able to decompose more than just food? As soon as he finished his thought, Kevin was struck with a brilliant idea. Turning to Jackson with a bright brimming smile, he said, You know what, Jackson? I think I just figured out how to solve the rat crisis. After descending down into the sewers, Kevin and Jackson were attacked by a pair of giant rats. Kevin managed to fend them off, but still got bit in the process. On their way out of the sewers, Jackson showed Kevin the main overflow chamber, which Al Capone and a man named Cade once used as a hub to smuggle liquor into the city. After climbing back up to the surface, Kevin saw another giant rat eating from a dumpster in the alleyway, and much to his surprise, the rat looked like it was capable of digesting actual Finally, after Kevin got his idea about how to solve the rat crisis, 
He and Jackson went to the hospital where Dr. Serafina Willow, the Williams family's physician, was waiting for them. Kevin would have tended his wound himself, but after getting distracted by the pizza-eating rat, he knew the time was running short. An infection might delay his return to Hollywood to seek the Lumiere film pieces, and that was something he could not allow to happen. After pulling on some gloves, she rolled her chair next to Kevin's leg and examined it closely. It's a pretty bad bite, she said with a serious look on her face. You're lucky you got here when you did. Another minute down in the sewers and it might have gotten infected. Kevin gritted his teeth as Dr. Willow patted his wound with some rubbing alcohol. It probably would have gotten infected if I hadn't taken that recovery pill. What do you think, doctor? Do I need any stitches? Dr. Willow considered it for a moment, assessing the damage, and then said, Yes, maybe just one or two to be safe. Do you want some anesthetics? Kevin shook his head. No, I'll be fine. Lay into me, Doc. Dr. Willow chuckled as she rolled her chair over to the nearest drawer and took out a needle and some thread. As she began to stitch him up, Dr. Willow was curious to know more about the situation. So you were down in the sewers to tackle the giant rat problem, huh? Any idea what you're going to do about it? Just then, Jackson, who was sitting in the corner, threw his head back and laughed. Go ahead, Kevin. Tell her what you told me. I've never heard a crazier idea in my life. Kevin watched as Dr. Willow pulled on the thread. It's not crazy, Jackson. It's a perfectly balanced symbiotic relationship. You see, Dr. Willow, before coming here, we saw a giant rat tear through a pizza box if it were just as good as the pizza. It ate the whole thing and didn't leave a single scrap, which made me think that the mutation must have given them the ability to process non-organic compounds like cardboard and plastic. In other words, garbage. Jackson crossed his arms and let out another chuckle. Go on. This is the best part. Dr. Willow wasn't laughing. She seemed genuinely interested in what Kevin was thinking. So if we can herd all the rats to the dump, Kevin continued, then they will be well fed for the rest of their lives and our garbage will decompose two or three times as fast. It's a total win-win. Chicago will come to be known as one of the cleanest cities in the world because we'll have giant rats to eat all of our garbage. Unable to hold it in, Jackson burst out into a fit of laughter. Now, listen here. I've heard a lot of crazy ideas in my life, but this one takes the cake. Cooperating with rats? <laughs> Maybe in your next big Hollywood movie, Kevin, but in real life? No way. Animals can be a lot more reasonable than you might think, Jackson, Kevin replied. Over the course of my adventures, I've cooperated with all kinds of animals. Bees, snakes, rhinos, sharks, you name it. Every animal can be helpful in its own unique way, even giant rats. Dr. Willow didn't think it was crazy, but there was still one thing she didn't understand. I think it's a great idea, Kevin, but how are you going to herd the rats all the way to the dump? Kevin had an answer for everything. Simple, he said. We lure them there with pizza their favorite food. When I saw the rat that was eating, it was comfortable enough to let me communicate with it, and all I heard ringing around in its head was how much it loved pizza. We can lure them around by dropping pizzas into the sewers, and lucky for us, Jackson here knows them like the back of his hand. Now that Kevin wanted his help, Jackson became a bit more serious. I don't know, Kevin. I like your pie-in-the-sky ambition, but to be honest, it sounds to me like a waste of time. And because the rats are bound to multiply so quickly, time isn't exactly a luxury we can afford to waste right now. Just then, Dr. Willow pulled on the thread and closed Kevin's stitches. Well, do you have a better idea? She asked. Jackson answered in an assertive tone of voice. Well, if you ask me, and technically I am the professional here, I think we should evacuate the city and carpet bomb the entire so that nothing, absolutely nothing, is left alive. It needs to be treated like an emergency. Kevin looked at Jackson. That idea is much crazier than mine, Jackson. We can't evacuate the entire city. That's insane. Jackson held his ground. Desperate times call for desperate measures, Kevin. You saw those things and how many babies they had. If they decide to crawl up from the sewers all at once, then we're done for. Well, Kevin said, 
Thankfully, it's not up to you. It's up to the mayor. I'll give her a call and see what she wants to do. As Dr. Willow put the finishing touches on his stitches, Kevin pulled out his cell phone and called Lily. After a few rings, she answered, eager to hear what they'd learned. Hi, dear, Kevin said. It came at a bit of a price, but Jackson and I were able to learn more about the giant rats. Here's the solution I have in mind. When she heard both ideas, Lily much preferred the solution of herding the rats to the dump over evacuating the city and bombing the sewers. It's a win-win, she exclaimed. We'll cut our garbage output in half if we have the rats to eat it all up. Way to go, Kevin. I knew I could count on you. Kevin had her on speaker for all to hear, so now their plan was set. After saying goodbye, he turned to Jackson and said, I need you for this, Jackson. Nobody knows the sewer system better than you. Is there a waterway that leads all the way to the dump? Jackson was slow to answer. There is, but I'm still not sure about this, Kevin. I've been killing rats my whole career, and my instincts are telling me we need to kill them now more than ever. Kevin had just the thing to sucker him in. Tell you what, he said, if you help me with this, I'll listen to one of your movie pitches. Jackson looked up at Kevin and grinned. You will? He asked with a grin on his face. Well, all right then, you have a deal. After being led out of the hospital, Kevin and Jackson went back to Jackson's store to draw up a plan. Leading Kevin into the back, Jackson pulled out a huge blueprint of the sewer systems and unrolled it over a table. Then, with a marker, he started circling important points on the map. Right here is the old commercial district, where the rat problem is the worst. From there, we can lure them down this tunnel under Canal Street to this one under Goose Island, all the way to this one under Wrigley Field, which leads straight to the dump. All in all, we're looking at a distance of about 17 miles. Kevin nodded as his eyes traced the route. And there are manholes along the way so we can drop pizzas down and keep the rats moving. Jackson circled them with his marker. Yes, there's about 30 manholes along the way, he replied. Then, without saying a word, Kevin took out his cell phone and made a call. Hi, is this Tony's Pizza? We're going to need 600 double extra large pizzas, ASAP. With a plan in motion, Kevin and Jackson took the van over to Tony's Pizza and picked up their order. As the girl behind the counter helped them carry out the pizza, she asked, Is one of your kids having the biggest birthday party ever or something? Kevin shook his head with a smirk. Believe it or not, these pizzas are helping us save the city. Once all the pizzas had been loaded into the van, Jackson and Kevin drove to the old commercial district and parked beside the first manhole on their list. After lifting it open, they took one of the pizzas and dropped it down into the darkness. Then, Kevin took a mental precision pill to heighten his senses and lowered his head into the hole to hear better. Well, Jackson asked, do you hear anything? Kevin didn't hear much at first, but then, all of a sudden, he heard hundreds of rodent feet clamoring together at once as loud as galloping horses. Oh boy, they're coming, Kevin exclaimed. We better hurry and throw down the next pizza before they get thrown off the scent. With a burst of speed, Kevin and Jackson sprinted back into the van and raced to the next manhole three or four blocks south. Then they traversed the city, zigzagging back and forth between manholes, tossing pizzas down to lure the rats towards the dump. Each time they stopped, Kevin listened closely to make sure the rats were still coming. And sure enough, they kept up with incredible speed. Along the way, while riding in the Crow Exterminator van with Jackson, Kevin laughed quietly to himself and thought of his recent challenges with the Lumiere films, the many dead ends, and the often mysterious counsel from the Night King. Tossing out these pizza to the rats, Kevin thought, reminds me of the spoonfuls of clues the Night King doles out to me. I certainly hope that when I finally achieve the upper realm, it won't be anything like the Chicago City dump. After another couple of miles, Jackson parked the van and the two men climbed out. Their last stop wasn't a manhole, but a drain pipe that flooded straight into the dump. With the last few pizzas in hand, Kevin and Jackson approached the drain pipe and tossed them in as deep as they could, except for the last one, which they dangled at the very edge of the pipe. Then, all there was to do was sit back and wait. Standing by the pipe with his hands on his hips, Kevin said, Well, Jackson... So far, my plan seems to be working pretty well, don't you think? 
Even after all of this, Jackson was still skeptical. I never said you couldn't lure them all the way to the dump, Kevin. That much was within reason. But will they really start eating our garbage for us and cease to be a threat? Now that has yet to be seen. Well, Kevin said, keep your eyes open because you're about to see it. After a few minutes, there was still no sign of the giant rats. Kevin took a few steps into the drain pipe for a closer listen, but he didn't hear anything coming and was beginning to worry. Oh no, he thought. Could they have gotten lost along the way? I hope nothing's gone wrong. Just then, as if an earthquake was happening, the tunnel began to rumble. Kevin told Jackson of his plan to lure Chicago's giant rats to the city dump with pizzas so that they could eat garbage to their heart's content and thus kill two birds with one stone. The rats would not terrorize the citizens while the city would be cleaned of trash. Though Jackson thought the scheme was crazy, he helped Kevin, who worried that the rats had not followed them all the way to the dump until he heard a thundering roar. As he began to sense the rats charging forward, Kevin quickly sprinted out of the tunnel and shouted, Look out, Jackson! She's about to blow! Jackson took a step back and held his breath. Suddenly, hordes of rats began to spill out of the drain pipe like a great furry waterfall. For over five minutes, they continued to pour out into the dump and disperse into the piles of garbage. All in all, there must have been over 200,000 of them. As the rats started to gorge on the garbage like an all-you-can-eat buffet, Jackson looked absolutely shocked. But Kevin just threw his head back and laughed with delight. See, Jackson? I told you my idea would work. Jackson was almost speechless. I... I really can't believe it. In all my years as an exterminator, I honestly thought that killing rats was the only solution to the problem. Already, the rats had devoured a pile of garbage that was over 10 yards tall. By the looks of it, Kevin remarked, Chicago is about to have a lot less garbage on its hands. The mayor is going to be thrilled. As they sat back and watched the rats clear away more and more garbage, Jackson suddenly remembered something. All right, Kevin, I held up my end of the bargain. Now it's time for you to hold up yours. Remembering what he had promised, Kevin smiled and said, All right, Jackson, fair enough. Let's hear that movie pitch of yours. Just one for now, though. All right? Jackson nodded enthusiastically and then paused to gather his thoughts. All right. Imagine this, he said. It's a kid's movie about a feeling and thinking toaster who goes to Mars with a bunch of other human-like kitchen appliances. They go to space to search for a long-lost treasure, but as it turns out, the real treasure is the friends they made along the way. I call it the courageous little toaster. What do you think? Kevin let out a deep breath. I'm running out of things to say to these aspiring screenwriters, he thought to himself. Then, with a forced smile, Kevin patted Jackson on the back and said, That sounds amazing, Jackson. Really incredible stuff. I'll have to think about it. Anyway, what do you say we get out of here and leave the rats to it? I could go for some pizza myself right about now. As the rats continued to dig and tear their way through the garbage, Kevin and Jackson got back in the van and went out for a well-deserved slice of pizza. Along the way, Jackson tried to pitch more scripts, but Kevin gracefully changed the subject each time. The next morning, Lily called a press conference to inform the city of the miraculous news. Standing at a podium outside City Hall, she cleared her throat and began to address a crowd of reporters standing around her. Ladies and gentlemen, citizens of Chicago, I've called this press conference to announce the wonderful news that the giant rat crisis has finally been solved. As the words left her mouth, the crowd broke into chatter. Some were still skeptical, some were relieved, but everyone was surprised. Propped up behind Lily, a large screen began to stream live footage from the dump, where giant rats could be seen munching on garbage. As it turns out, Lily continued, a side effect of the mutation is that the giant rats are able to digest inorganic compounds like cardboard and plastic. For this reason, they were relocated to the dump where they will help Chicago dramatically reduce its garbage output. It's a win-win for all of us. Faced with direct evidence of the conflict's resolution, the crowd began to applaud. Good work, Williams. You averted a citywide catastrophe, someone shouted. All without resorting to violence, shouted someone else. 
Most were delighted, but of course there was bound to be one or two naysayers. Mayor Williams, Gary Brownstein with Chicago Beat. Are you sure it was a good idea to leave the rats alive? What if they leave the dump and start attacking the city again? Lily tackled the pointed question with elegance and grace. I understand the concern, sir, but the dump will always have more than enough garbage to keep the rats satisfied. Should a threat ever arise, though, you have my word that I'll have a solution for that, too. After the press conference, Lily stepped off the podium to more applause. Now that's what I call a win for Chicago, she thought to herself. Kevin had been standing in the crowd the whole time, and as soon as the press conference was over, he ran up to Lily and threw his arms around her. Congratulations, Mayor Williams. There's no problem you can't handle. Lily blushed. Well, first husband, I certainly couldn't have done it without you. Kevin playfully scoffed and rolled his eyes. Oh, please, it's a thankless job. Then Lily took a deep breath and said, Well, now that the rat crisis is over and done with, I suppose we should be getting back to Hollywood, shouldn't we? At first, Kevin thought he misheard her. We? You mean you want to come back with me? Oh, boy, I'd love that, Lily. Hollywood's a crazy place, and it would be wonderful to have you there to help keep me grounded. Lily smirked. Not only do I want to go back with you, but I actually have to, she said. The Lily Pad is hosting a charity event in Hollywood this Saturday afternoon. We're auctioning off famous vehicles from TV and movies. Didn't I tell you? Kevin shook his head, but his smile was beaming. No, it must have slipped your mind with all the stress you were under. What a great surprise, though. Are you ready to head back immediately? Lily nodded. I just have to pack my bags and we can be off. Later that evening, after saying goodbye to their parents, Kevin and Lily drove to the airport and took a private jet back to Los Angeles. Kevin wanted to make sure that Lily was pampered in every way since she was soon going to be the mother to his twin children. As they flew over the city that night, it was lit up like a spread of diamonds. Then, as they walked into the Beverly Hills Hotel, Lily looked around in awe. Wow, she said. This place is the perfect mixture of boutique and luxury. The pink walls are so energizing. You're going to love the presidential suite we're staying in, Kevin remarked. Come on, I'll show you. Just then, as Kevin began to lead the way, Madam Spatzel stumbled into the lobby. Is that you, Kevin? You're back. As he turned around, Kevin quickly gathered that Madam Spatzel was just returning from another night out. Her dress, which looked like it was made out of snakeskin, was lopsided and there was mascara running down her face. Hey, madam, Kevin said, back from another night out, I assume. Madam Spatzel nodded with a gleeful smile. Oh, yes, it was amazing, Kevin. I went to a party in the Hollywood Hills tonight that had enormous moving ice sculptures and a build-your-own-hot-air-balloon station. It was marvelous, Kevin, just marvelous. Then, noticing Lily, Madam Spatzel said, Oh, and Lily, I haven't seen you since that gender reveal party. My song that I wrote that night hit number 74 on the Icelandic alternative charts. Lily hugged Madame Spatzel while being careful not to get runny mascara on her own dress. Your performance in Chains of Desire was simply mesmerizing. I can't wait to see what you do next. Madame Spatzel lit up like a Christmas tree. I can't wait either, Lily. It's going to be glorious. Starting to feel a bit tired, Kevin yawned and said, Well, we better hit the hay. Lily's got a big auction tomorrow and needs her sleep. Isn't that right, dear? Lily paused and looked around the hotel. Actually, Kevin, I think I'll poke around the hotel a bit first. I'm just in love with the style of the place. Kevin chuckled. You go ahead then, Lily. The presidential suite is just up the hall on the second floor. I'll see you whenever you're ready. With that, Kevin rolled his suitcase down the hall, but Madame Spatzel stayed with Lily. Would you mind if I came with you? She asked. The night is young and I still have so much energy to burn. Lily shook her head with a smile. Not at all, Madam. I appreciate the company. As they strolled around, Lily's fine eye caught everything. To her, the landscaping, architecture, and decor were all immaculate. When they saw a room with its door open, Lily couldn't help but peek inside. Gosh... They keep the place so clean, she remarked as she stepped inside. Just then, she noticed a maid cleaning up around the bed. Oh, I'm sorry, Lily said. I didn't mean to disturb you. I was just taking a look around the hotel. The maid greeted them with a smile. It's perfectly all right, ma'am, 
It certainly is a beautiful hotel, isn't it? As Madame Spatzel followed Lily inside, she recognized them immediately. Hey, I know that face, she said. Have I seen you around somewhere? The maid nodded politely. Yes, madam. I just joined Sympathy last week. I think we met at one of the meetings. That's right, Madame Spatzel exclaimed. What was your name again? Hazel, the maid replied. Lily was a bit confused. What's Sympathy? she asked. It's like a support group for aspiring actors, Madame Spatzel said. The leader of it, Lance Reeves, is like a miracle worker. He knows just how to take our most vulnerable insecurities and mold them into our greatest strengths. Lily was intrigued. Turning to Hazel, she said, So you want to become an actor then, Hazel? Well, that's amazing. Good for you for following your dreams. Hazel blushed. Thank you so much, ma'am. It wasn't an easy decision, but what life is really worth living if you aren't following your passions? For better or worse, I knew I had to at least try. Lily was moved by Hazel's sincerity and clarity of vision. I believe we can do anything we set our minds to, Hazel. I'll keep an eye out for you whenever I go to the movies. With that, Lily and Madame Spatzel left Hazel to continue her work. For some reason, the brief interaction had left a real impression on Lily, and she really wanted to see Hazel succeed. The next morning was the day of the big auction. Lily woke up early to shower, but seeing that there were only enough towels for one, she called down to the lobby and asked for some more. Then, when the maid arrived to drop them off, Lily thought of Hazel and asked, Excuse me, but do you know what hours Hazel is working today? I met her last night and would just love to speak with her again. The maid looked back at Lily with a confused look. Hazel? I've never heard of anyone named Hazel who works here. Utterly bewildered, Lily's jaw dropped in shock. After helping Lily win as newly elected mayor of Chicago by finding a way to curb the rat population in the city, Kevin returned with Lily to L.A., where Lily was preparing to host a charity auction of famous cars. Joining Kevin and his team at the Beverly Hills Hotel, Lily took a tour and struck up conversation with a housekeeper and aspiring actress named Hazel. Madame Spatzel recognized Hazel from a meeting at Sympathy, which Hazel had just joined. When Lily asked a different housekeeper about Hazel the next day, the woman informed her that no one by that name worked at the hotel. Lily, the housekeeper, deeply confused. That's not possible, she said. I just met her yesterday. We had an entire conversation. The other housekeeper shrugged. There was one new girl, but I never got her name. I'm only here today because someone didn't show up for her shift. Maybe it was this Hazel person. Everyone else here is pretty professional. It's always the new ones we have to worry about being unreliable. The description of Hazel didn't resonate with Lily. That doesn't sound like the woman I met at all, she replied. She seemed like she had a good head on her shoulders and was happy to have this job. The housekeeper clearly wanted to move on with her duties but couldn't appear impolite to this important guest. I'm sorry I don't have more answers for you, Mrs. Williams. Is there anything else I can help you with? Lily quickly realized she was holding her up. No, thank you. You've been very helpful. Thank you for the towels. The housekeeper nodded and exited the room, leaving Lily to ponder what had actually happened to Hazel. She couldn't dwell too long, however. Her charity auction was that day, and such a large-scale event was going to require her full focus. That afternoon, she arrived with Kevin at the Peterson Automotive Museum, an architectural marvel in the Miracle Mile neighborhood of Los Angeles. The red glow of the building encased in a frame of steel ribbons gave the appearance of flame shooting from an exhaust pipe. Kevin brought along new Radiance member Jericho, who specialized in car stunts in his film career. Jericho's eyes bulged from his head as he took in the showroom filled with the most iconic vehicles ever shown on screen. Feel free to take a look around, Kevin offered, but Jericho had taken off for the Back to the Future DeLorean before he could even finish his sentence. Kevin turned to Lily. Well, you certainly gathered an impressive collection for the auction. Lily looked at Kevin gratefully. Do you think so? I feel so guilty that the campaign and now being mayor has pulled my attention away from the lily pad and all of its charitable works. I really want this event to make up for it. Kevin kissed Lily on the forehead. He was in awe of her relentlessly loving nature. 
You do so much good for the world in so many different ways, and I have yet to see you fail at anything. The event is going to be a huge success. Just look at this crowd. Glancing around at the black tie-clad gathering, he added, I'm going to have some serious competition if I want to make a winning bid for these cars. Lily raised an eyebrow. Didn't think you were the type to want to drive around town in the Batmobile. Kevin laughed. No, my rental car hasn't failed me yet out here. I'll have to figure out what I'll actually do with the cars. He gave Lily a squeeze. But you know I love donating to a good cause. She smiled at him lovingly. Now that sounds like you. Their sweet moment was interrupted by Atticus Davel, the original financier for the Cleopatra movie that Kevin was now producing. He was more sober than the first time they'd met at the polo lounge, but just as bitter. Let me guess, Atticus said with his usual swarmy tone while approaching Kevin and Lily. First, you outbid me on my movie, now you want to outbid me on a car. I better hide Janine before you try and buy her too, he said, indicating his date on his arm. Jasmine, his date corrected him. Kevin rolled his eyes. This guy was a human nightmare. First, Kevin said, feeling like he was giving lessons to a child on how to act in public. It's a pleasure to meet you, Jasmine. This is my wife, Lily. It's her event tonight. To Atticus, he added, and I think it's safe to assume that neither of these ladies is for sale. Lily graciously smiled at Jasmine. Secondly, Atticus, I did come prepared to make bids tonight, and when it comes to getting what I want, I have a winning track record. But if I do lose to you, I'll be relieved to know that your money is going to charity instead of another train wreck of a movie. Atticus fumed, turning red while Jasmine suppressed a giggle. Kevin had Atticus up against the ropes, and he went in for the kill. Leaning in close, he whispered, By the way, Margot Nichols is directing my $500 million movie. Next time you want to blackmail one of my friends, remember what I said about my track record. Now truly flustered, Atticus turned on his heel and stormed off, leaving Jasmine, who merely threw her arms up in frustration. She turned to Kevin and Lily to say, It was great meeting you both, before downing her glass of champagne and smoothly placing it on a passing tray on her way out the door. Relieved to be done with that whole encounter, Lily looked around at her event. The auction is going to start soon, but first I'm going to need the bartender to make his strongest possible Shirley Temple. She gave Kevin's arm a squeeze before excusing herself towards the bar to order her non-alcoholic drink. Just as she left, Jericho ran to Kevin in a flurry of excitement. Kevin, he exclaimed. Lily really got everything. The Jeep from Jurassic Park. The Ferrari from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. He dreamily looked off in the distance. Watching that car fly through that glass window is what made me want to do stunts for a living. You could have given me a million guesses and I never would have thought that that was the movie that inspired your career, Kevin said earnestly. But you gotta check this one out, Jericho added, leading Kevin over to another car. Kevin wasn't normally one to be wowed by luxury items, but even he couldn't deny his attraction as Jericho led him to the James Bond Aston Martin. A thing of beauty, Jericho mused. Kevin nodded in agreement. The moment was instantly upended by Atticus, who had already been standing by the car admiring it with Milo. Can't you just leave me alone? He snapped at Kevin. You're welcome to leave. Your date already did. I promise I won't follow you, Kevin replied. I'm not leaving without this car, Atticus said, indicating the Aston Martin. And I don't care what it takes, so you can put your checkbook away. Kevin looked over the Aston Martin. It really was an incredible car, and he couldn't deny that he was having fun constantly dunking on such a terrible person. I don't know, Atticus, Kevin said with an air of sarcasm. This is clearly the crown jewel here. I don't know if I can justify not bidding on it. He glanced over the car, mostly to himself, he muttered. I'd really like to test drive it first, though. Atticus let out a condescending laugh. You idiot! You can't just take an auction item out for a test drive. How quickly you forgot that this is my wife's event, Kevin said casually. Atticus was really boiling at Kevin constantly having the upper hand in every conversation. Desperately trying to get a leg up on Kevin, he challenged. Well, don't be greedy then. If you want to test drive a Bond car, do it properly. 
Let's race. Loser pays $10 million. Kevin considered the offer. Fine, I'll race, but the loser pays $10 million to the lily pad. Atticus rolled his eyes. Sure, whatever, Mother Teresa, but I'm taking the Aston Martin I had my eye on at first. Like a child on a ground, Kevin thought to himself. To Atticus, he said, you can drive the Aston Martin. I'll have plenty of chances after I win it in the auction. Jericho leaned toward Kevin. What are you going to drive instead? Kevin looked around the showroom. He needed to choose correctly if he was going to have a chance against the Aston Martin. Finally, he saw his choice. There's only one car I can possibly count on to pull off an underdog win in a drag race, he replied to Jericho with a smile. It's greased lightning from the movie Grease. Jericho, already in a state of giddiness just from being at the event, high five Kevin. Yes, he cheered. In their excitement, they didn't see Atticus whisper to actor Milo Hardy, who quickly exited the room. The on-site mechanics will bring the cars around, Atticus said to Kevin with a surprising air of confidence. Are you sure you want to put your winning record at stake? Don't try to back out now because you're afraid you'll lose to a Ford Deluxe, Kevin quipped. We're racing. Kevin confidently marched outside while Atticus slowly followed, wearing a smirk. The Aston Martin and Grease Lightning were lined up on Wilshire Boulevard. Kevin jumped into the Ford convertible and could barely contain his excitement as he turned the key in the ignition. Even though compared to the smooth purr of the Aston Martin, Ford's engine sounded like it smoked 10 packs a day. Next to him, Atticus clearly felt at home in a car that exemplified elitism. He glanced at Kevin with a casual coolness that defied how flustered he had been in their previous conversations. Ready to take a drive? Wait. Kevin turned his head to see Lily rushing down the sidewalk towards Kevin's car. I'm coming too, she announced as she jumped in the passenger side. Kevin tensed up. Lily, no, he pleaded. I'm not taking you drag racing while you're pregnant. It's too risky. Lily put her hand on Kevin's. There's no safer place for me than being with you, she said. Besides, this will be great publicity for the lily pad, and I really do want to make up for slacking this year. Please, Kevin. Looking at Lily's pleading eyes, Kevin knew this was the one battle he'd lose every time. Lily was his biggest weakness. Okay, he relented. Buckle up. Lily kissed him and wore a wide grin as she snapped her seatbelt. A museum staff member nearly having a panic attack over putting the cars at risk but powerless to stop the race, stepped into the street between the two cars. She shakily raised her hand. The race is a straight shot down Wilshire Boulevard. First to reach La Brea Avenue wins. Her voice cracking, she added, please be careful. She dropped her arm and the car sped off. Lily threw her hands in the air with glee. On the sidewalk, the crowd cheered, snapped pictures, and placed bets on the winner. Jericho cheered on his friend, only slightly jealous that he wasn't getting to race himself. Lucky bastard, he said to himself. But then he noticed the mechanic who had brought out Kevin's car. Standing at the back of the crowd, wearing a sly smile, was Sergio, leader of the Stuntmen's Guild. At Lily's charity car auction, Kevin had another run-in with Atticus Stavel, the original financier of the Cleopatra movie. When both men considered bidding on James Bond's Aston Martin, Atticus proposed they make a friendly wager on a drag race. Kevin agreed, choosing Grease Lightning as his vehicle when Atticus insisted on driving the Aston Martin. Lily pressured Kevin into letting her join him in the race, and the two cars took off down Wilshire Boulevard. But after they started driving, Jericho, who had joined Kevin at the event, noticed that the mechanic who had brought Kevin's car around was none other than Sergio, leader of the stuntmen's guild. Jericho was disturbed by Sergio's wicked smile as he watched Kevin's car race away. The stuntmen's guild had it out for Kevin ever since he'd first gotten his hands on the Lumiere film that would grant him access to the upper realm. Sensing Kevin was in danger, Jericho quickly pulled out a cell and called Kevin. Kevin, meanwhile, was currently flying past the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Between the wind rushing past the open convertible and Lily's squeals of delight, Jericho's call to Kevin's cell sitting on the front console went unnoticed. Miraculously, Kevin had jumped out to a lead over Atticus in the vintage Ford. 
but Atticus wasn't content with constantly coming in second place to Kevin. Kevin was startled to feel a bump against his rear tire, causing him to lose his momentum as he adjusted and allowed Atticus to catch up. What the heck? Kevin yelled to the other car as Atticus pulled level with him. This is supposed to be a friendly race. You love to bump people out of the way when it suits you, Atticus yelled in response. Don't dish it out if you can't take it. Atticus floored the gas, pulling ahead of Kevin as they sped past luxury apartment buildings and sushi restaurants. Only a few blocks to go. Hold on, Lily, Kevin instructed as he pushed grease lightning to its limit. Kevin pulled even with the Aston Martin just as they flew across the finish line of La Brea Avenue. At the next red light, Kevin looked over to Atticus. Despite his resentment that Atticus had made the race more dangerous than it needed to be, there was nothing to gain by challenging him on it now. Good race, Atticus, Kevin called over. I think we can agree that it was a tie. May the best man win at auction. But Atticus wasn't so ready to put the race behind them. That race was a little too short and straightforward for my liking, Atticus replied. Let's kick this up a notch. Mulholland Drive will show us who the real driver is. Kevin glanced nervously at Lily. He had never been one to settle for a tie, but Kevin knew that the winding curves of Mulholland would be even more dangerous for her. Lily returned Kevin's gaze with steely resolve. Crush him, she said forcefully. Kevin couldn't deny how attracted he was to this new assertive version of Lily. Energized by her encouragement, he looked over toward Atticus. You're on. We take Mulholland to Beverly Glen, and then the first driver back to the museum wins, Atticus replied. Disregarding the etiquette of a fair start, Atticus screeched away in the Aston Martin heading north. Kevin sighed. He really chooses the most obnoxious thing to do at all times, he said to Lily. I don't like cheaters, Lily replied. Make him pay. Kevin was all too happy to oblige. He floored the gas and followed Atticus north toward the Hollywood Hills. Atticus's head started put him out of Kevin's view, and Kevin knew Atticus's familiarity with the city would give him an advantage. Kevin swerved as he made a hard left onto Hollywood Boulevard, narrowly dodging tourists and street performers as he flew past the iconic El Capitan Theater. Uh, Kevin? Lily's eyes were further down the street, which was completely closed off for a red carpet premiere at the Chinese Theater, the other legendary movie palace on the block. Time to improvise, Kevin thought. With another jerk of the wheel, Grease Lightning hopped the curb on the opposite sidewalk, circumventing the photographer's celebrities and a noticeably jealous Vin Diesel. Escaping the crowded epicenter of Hollywood, Kevin once again turned north, heading into the Hollywood Hills where the mansions grew larger as traffic continued to thin. Meanwhile, at the top of the hill, having just arrived on Mulholland, Atticus sat fuming on the side of the road while a man who must have been the oldest officer in the history of the LAPD wrote a citation. Mulholland tends to attract adrenaline junkies like yourself, but this is a family neighborhood, you see, the officer said calmly while taking his sweet time to write out the ticket. Yes, officer, Atticus said through gritted teeth while his knuckles turned white on the steering wheel. He was then horrified to see Kevin turn on to Mulholland and head west ahead of him. Kevin and Lily burst out laughing as they saw Atticus's predicament. That just might make me start believing in karma, Lily said between giggles. He's not going to give up that easily, Kevin replied. We can't slow up now. Back at the traffic stop, the elderly officer finished his citation, handing it to Atticus. He said, you have a good day now. Be safe out there. Thank you, officer. Atticus forced out, barely able to contain himself. As the officer walked back to his car, Atticus pulled ahead at a conservative pace, then floored it as soon as he turned out of view. As Kevin zigzagged around the tight curves, he saw Atticus pull into view in his rearview mirror. Kevin kept his focus as he navigated the narrow turns, hoping Atticus would have the good sense not to try to pass him. No such luck. Kevin gripped the steering wheel tighter as he watched Atticus in the rearview mirror as he moved into the opposing lane, only to swerve back once an oncoming car pulled into view. Atticus tried this twice more, each time thwarted by an oncoming car. Needing to up the ante, Atticus started really using the James Bond car to his advantage. In the rearview, Kevin watched the car almost completely vanish. 
Atticus had activated the adaptive camouflage, which meant the way the light refracted as the car twisted and turned made the Aston Martin almost impossible to track. Atticus then unleashed the concealed shotguns, hitting a sign warning of an upcoming traffic light squarely in the middle of the pole, causing the sign to collapse into the street. Kevin swerved to avoid the sign, forcing one of his wheels to precariously teeter over the edge of the cliff. This is going too far, Kevin thought. But luckily, Kevin's cool head allowed him to maintain an attention to detail that was beyond Atticus. Having been made very aware of the upcoming traffic light, Kevin slowed just enough to swerve onto Beverly Glen as an unfocused Atticus flew through the light in a blur. That should at least give us a few seconds to put some distance between us, Kevin said to Lily with a hint of relief. Kevin hit a pothole as he headed down the road toward Bel Air, and as he slowed to navigate the next turn, he was horrified to realize that the brakes were no longer working. Stealing a glance at his pregnant wife, Kevin was now truly afraid. The brakes are out, he yelled to Lily. What? she replied, equally alarmed. How is that possible? I don't know, but we're heading downhill and the area is only going to get more populated. Kevin deftly navigated the curves in the road but had no way of slowing the momentum as the car gained speed downhill. He grabbed his phone off of the console and called Jericho. Jericho, who had been all nervous ever since he spotted Sergio at the event, answered in a panic. Kevin, the race was only supposed to be a mile long. Where are you? We added a little extension, Kevin said, keeping his voice calm and I'm going to need your expertise as a stunt driver. What do you mean? Jericho asked with growing concern. I'm currently heading downhill on Beverly Glen and the brakes are out. Jericho glanced over at Sergio, who was standing with Milo Hardy. Both were looking way too interested in Jericho's telephone conversation. Kevin, Jericho said, trying to keep his voice low. I've only had brakes fail on me once before and it was on a closed set with a whole safety team present. I don't know how to help you. Don't sweat it, Jericho, Kevin replied. You can help me by figuring out how this happened. I'll see you back at the museum, probably sooner than I expected. Kevin hung up and glanced at Lily, knowing that failure here wasn't an option. Jericho put down his phone. As he watched Sergio's and Milo's unapologetic laughter, Jericho knew it wouldn't be too difficult to do what Kevin requested of him. He just wasn't sure if that knowledge would be enough to save Kevin and Lily from a fatal car crash in the middle of Hollywood. At Lily's charity car auction, Kevin found both himself and rival film financier Atticus Davel interested in James Bond's Aston Martin. Atticus proposed the race, and when their original race down Wilshire Boulevard ended in a tie, Atticus suggested they extend the race to the windy, treacherous Mulholland Drive. With Lily in the passenger seat, Kevin kept his cool while Atticus tried increasingly dangerous tactics to win the race. Kevin took the lead heading downhill from Mulholland Drive, only for the brakes of his car grease lightning to stop working. He called Jericho, who watched as stuntmen's guild leader Sergio and slimy actor Milo laughed at the news of Kevin's predicament. After Kevin hung up, Jericho marched over to Sergio and Milo, who looked absolutely gleeful. Something funny? Jericho demanded. It hadn't been long since Jericho himself was in the stuntmen's guild, but already Sergio was unrecognizable to him. Jericho couldn't believe he'd ever been so misguided as to have aligned with a group like that, especially now that he was working for Kevin's Radiance organization and aspiring to better things under Kevin's leadership. Inside joke. Sergio replied with a smirk. Jericho's anger was rising. Putting lives in danger is a joke to you now? Now, Sergio stopped smiling. He walked towards Jericho with a posture that would alarm even the most hardened mobsters and assassins. If I remember correctly, Jericho, Sergio said coolly, it wasn't too long ago that you were willing to do what was necessary to fulfill our purpose, to protect what needs protecting and eliminate the threats. Jericho stood his ground in the face of Sergio's intimidation. I've got a new purpose now, he replied, an honorable one. Don't act like the work you do is based on morality. You collect the paycheck and ask questions later. There's a reason you never rose to our upper ranks, Sergio taunted him. 
Your ignorance prevents you from seeing the bigger picture. You languish on the forest floor, blissfully unaware of those of us who have a bird's eye view. You're a little ant who merely chose a new master. How much do you actually know about Kevin Williams? Jericho hesitated to reply. His gut had always led him to trust Kevin, but he truthfully hadn't known him for that long. Sergio smirked. Collect the paycheck. Ask questions later. He casually walked away. Jericho stared after him, not wanting to admit how unnerved he was by Sergio's speech. But ultimately, Kevin wasn't his superior. He was his friend, and Jericho was going to stand by Kevin. Jericho took out his cell and called him. Kevin's phone rang as he swerved down Beverly Glen Boulevard. Grease Lightning was truly living up to its name as they crossed into the city limits of posh manicured Bel Air. Hey, Jericho, what have you found out? He said into the phone. It's the stuntmen, Jericho replied. Sergio was here. I think he sabotaged the car. Milo Hardy and I assume Atticus Davel were both in on it. So this thing definitely isn't going to just work itself out, Kevin mused. Thanks for your help, Jericho. I'll figure something out. He hung up the phone. Trouble really does find you wherever you go, Lily said with a slight smile as she gripped the handles on her door with one hand and cradled her belly with the other. Kevin was blown away by her composure. Between Lily and the twin she was carrying, Kevin's entire world was in that passenger seat, and Lily's unrelenting faith in him was the only motivation he needed. He reached the end of Beverly Glen and flew through the red light just before the light for the opposing traffic turned green. He swerved onto Sunset Boulevard heading east, hoping the slight incline would slow the momentum, but Grease Lightning had simply gained too much speed. Kevin couldn't help but let out a small laugh as he recalled the auto shop teacher's line in the movie Grease. If this car were in any better condition, it would fly. Ironic, given that if the car were in any better condition, it would stop flying. A light bulb went off for Kevin. He could slow the car the same way you slow a plane, by creating drag. He raised the retractable roof until it sat vertical, creating a makeshift parachute. The car started to slow. This is actually working, Kevin thought to himself. But just as he was about to let himself exhale, three gunshots rang out, puncturing the roof with a trio of bullet holes. The roof's flimsy material ripped apart, rendering their parachute useless and revealing Atticus maniacally closing in behind them, with one of the Aston Martin's concealed guns protruding from the hood. He's really intent on getting us killed. Kevin angrily thought to himself. But if there was one thing Kevin had learned through all of his trials and tribulations, it was that no matter how dire the situation seemed, there was always a way out. As he rolled through the wide, picturesque boulevard to Beverly Hills, he racked his brain for a solution. The solution, that's it. Lily, grab my satchel, he instructed. She grabbed the bag off the floor. What do you need? We need to create a solution to add a new layer of rubber to the tires, he explained. The heat from the friction with the road will keep the solution sticky and will slow the car down. You're brilliant, Lily replied. What do I need to do? In the satchel, there's a container of liquid rubber sealant. I need you to add an ionoacrylate adhesive to the liquid rubber. This will bond the rubber to the tire instead of transferring to the road. And I'm going to apply this by... Lily trailed off. Kevin was reluctant to ask Lily to put herself in an even more dangerous situation, but he had no other choice. There's a roller in the satchel, he explained. I need you to coat it with the solution and apply it by hand to both front tires. Kevin braced himself, but Lily continued to prove she was up for any challenge. In Lily's mind, she thought there was no way she would have done something like this three months ago. But having Kevin's babies inside of her had changed her life in many ways. And one way was that she wasn't afraid of anything anymore. Got it, Lily exclaimed. She went to work mixing the solution as Kevin pulled a hard left back onto Wilshire Boulevard. I don't want to put pressure on you, Kevin said. But we don't have much time before we reach the museum. Lily continued to stir the solution. Good thing I thrive under pressure. Done, she announced. Time to grease the wheels. Get it? She added to Kevin with a wink. 
God, I love you, Kevin said, returning her smile. So I'd prefer for spending the rest of my life with you to last for longer than the next five minutes. Go, go, go. You know I'm hopelessly devoted to you, Lily said with a laugh. Okay, now I'm done. Kevin couldn't help but laugh along with Lily's jokes even in the face of such dire circumstances. He kept his focus on the road but watched out of the corner of his eye as Lily leaned over the passenger side door with the roller. As she let the tire run against the roller, coating it with the solution, the tire began to slow. It's working, Kevin, she exclaimed. You're doing amazing, Lily, Kevin replied. Now the driver's side. As Lily made her way across the car, Atticus continued to tailgate them, bombarding them with every gadget and feature the Aston Martin had. But it seemed he had used up his resources too soon as the adaptive camouflage flickered on and off. Atticus tried to launch a rocket to down a traffic light only for the barrel to let out a weak cough. Lily made her way to the driver's side and sat on Kevin's lap as she leaned over the side. Man, Kevin thought, in any other situation, this would be a great time. Lily finished coating the tire as they barreled down the last few blocks of Wilshire Boulevard en route to the museum. As she made her way back to the passenger side, Atticus, having reached a new level of vengeful insanity, pulled out his own revolver from the glove compartment and fired a shot that whizzed just over Lily's head. This was the last straw for Kevin. Oh, hell no, he yelled. With the museum in view and the car thankfully beginning to slow, Kevin saw a barricade that Jericho had set up across the road as a last resort. Kevin caught the expressions of the onlookers as he approached. Jericho's desperate concern, the auction attendee's shocked horror, and Sergio and Milo's eager anticipation. Kevin yanked on the wheel just before hitting the barrier, spinning the car 180 degrees before it finally, mercifully screeched to a stop. Lily threw her arms around him and Kevin held her close, deeply appreciating every future second he'd have with her. Atticus, just a split second behind Kevin, was again unprepared for the obstacles that were of his own making. Having hoped to smash Grease Lightning into the barrier, Atticus was unable to react quickly enough to Kevin's slick maneuver and crash the Aston Martin head-on into the barricade. With the car already depleted by Atticus's excessive use of the bond gadgets, the old engine burst into flames. As Kevin, Lily, and the other onlookers watched in horror, there was only one gadget left in the car's arsenal for Atticus to use. Activating the most iconic feature of Bond's Aston Martin, Atticus triggered the ejector seat, launching him through the air before landing unceremoniously in the La Brea Tar Pits. Kevin's rivalry with opposing film financier Atticus Davel escalated at Lily's charity car auction, resulting in a car race through the streets of Los Angeles. The danger reached its peak when the brakes on Kevin's car, Grease Lightning, went out while heading downhill from Mulholland Drive. Kevin and Lily managed to whip up a rubber solution to slow their tires, just in time to cause Atticus to slam into a barrier outside the Peterson Automotive Museum, forcing him to use the Aston Martin ejector seat, which launched him into the La Brea tar pits. Having just witnessed Atticus launch himself through the air, Kevin, Lily, and the rest of the crowd rushed over to the La Brea tar pits to see the damage. They found Atticus smack in the middle of one of the tar pits covered head to toe in the black sticky liquid. Kevin couldn't help but think of the motor oil lace drink Atticus had sent to Kevin's polo lounge. Atticus's tar bath made for perfect symmetry in Kevin's mind. Some of the crowd, once seeing that Atticus wasn't injured, laughed at his ridiculous tarred appearance. If only someone had feathers, Lily said wryly. At that moment, a group of club kids passed by Atticus on their way to an event at the LACMA Museum. Honey, do you need some help? One said while reaching out a hand. I don't need your help, Atticus spat, already deep in the throes of humiliation. He clumsily clawed his way out of the tar pit, slipping on the edge and crashing right into the group of partiers. Atticus shoved the club kids off of him, but their feather boa stayed behind, now stuck to the tar. Lily couldn't help but voice her approval. Perfect. 
leaving the last shreds of his dignity in the tar, Atticus stumbled over to the fence where the crowd was watching. Are we here for a car auction or what? he yelled. Lily, her event having not remotely proceeded the way she expected, was the first to respond. Oh, we'll continue with the auction, but you've obviously lost the privilege of taking any more test drives. If you want to destroy another timeless vehicle, do it on your own time. You'll be getting a bill for the damages to the Aston Martin and Grease Lightning, and none of your auction bids will be honored until it's paid. Don't forget the $10 million you owe the lily pad for losing the race, Kevin chimed in. To Lily, he added with a smile, I'll throw in $10 million as well. Lily kissed Kevin as Atticus grimaced at them. Well, let's go then, Atticus growled, storming off back toward the museum. By the time they reached the museum, news had already spread about the mayor of Chicago and two movie producers drag racing famous cars around Hollywood. Just outside the door, Lily was accosted by a TMZ reporter. Mayor Williams, the reporter cried out. Do you have any comment on the rumors that you were spotted racing and grease lightning through the city? Lily, poised as ever, happily responded to the reporter. We're here for a charity car auction to benefit the lily pad. I'd like to thank our fellow racer, Atticus Davel, for helping us raise awareness all over this great city for the wonderful cause and even demonstrating the iconic ejector seat from James Bond's Aston Martin. A photographer snapped a picture of Atticus, who was tarred, feathered, and scowling. The auction is just about to begin at the Peterson Auto Museum, Lily continued. All are welcome to join our event, with all proceeds benefiting underprivileged communities in Chicago. Uh, thank you for your time the reporter replied, slightly disappointed to not get a more dramatic and inflammatory answer. Inside, Lily conducted the auction with a composure and grace that defied the fact that she had been shot at by Atticus just ten minutes ago. Thelma and Louise's Ford Thunderbird and Kit from Knight Rider were quickly snatched by eager bidders. The mayor of Los Angeles showed up and won the Chevy Malibu from Pulp Fiction, and even Jericho was able to snag the Mustang Fastback from Bullet with some added funds from Kevin, who was glad to help his new protege place the winning bid. Jericho couldn't help himself. As a stuntman who specialized in car stunts, this was one of the best days of his life. Hey, Sergio, he called over to his former boss. Look what my new colleague got me. Sergio, who had wanted to tarnish Kevin's reputation and his relationship with Jericho, could only walk away without a word. We must now move on to one of our most prized items, Lily announced. James Bond's Aston Martin. You have already seen this car in action, she said with a smile as the crowd chuckled. And we've been assured by Atticus Davel that he will arrange repairs for the vehicle after so generously demonstrating all that it can do. Atticus forced a smile that looked more like a grimace as the crowd politely clapped knowing Lily was giving a particularly generous interpretation of the events. We'll start the bidding at 20 million, Lily announced. Kevin happily raised his paddle. Most of the crowd was content to let Kevin win this one after everything they had seen, but before Lily could raise the price, Atticus called out, 25 million. Lily pursed her lips. Do I hear 30? Once again, Kevin calmly raised his paddle. 50 million. Atticus called out. Cleaving this was a trump card, he looked at Kevin with a smirk. There's no way that I'm leaving here without that car. As always, Atticus, may the best man win, Kevin said coolly. He patiently waited for Lily to raise the price while the crowd's eyes bounced back and forth between Kevin and Atticus like it was a tennis match. Do I hear 75 million? Lily asked from the pulpit, to which Kevin quickly responded by raising his paddle. Unnerved that Kevin so calmly agreed to such an outrageous number, Atticus's voice wasn't as confident as he rebounded with, 80 million. The whole room could sense blood in the water. How about 100? Lily asked boldly like she had stolen Atticus's swagger straight from his soul. Smiling at Lily, Kevin again raised his paddle. Now Atticus's voice was audibly shaking as he said, 101. 
Despite himself, Kevin almost felt bad for the guy at this point. He was clearly bluffing. Between the repairs for the cars and the 10 million he lost in the race, there was no way he still had 101 million to spend. For all Kevin knew, Atticus might not even have 101 actual dollars to his name. Kevin had learned that everything in Hollywood was about appearances, and Atticus was one of the best at creating an illusion of power and wealth. Kevin decided to put him out of his misery. For the first time, he didn't wait for Lily as he shouted, 150 million. The crowd gasped as Atticus stomped his feet, causing his shoes to stick to the floor. Lily couldn't take her eyes off of Kevin as she smiled and said, Going once? The crowd looked at Atticus, who merely buried his head in his hands, leaving feathers stuck to his forehead. Going twice, Lily continued. Sold to Kevin Williams for an unbelievable bid of $150 million. The crowd applauded, dazzled by how much entertainment had been provided at what would normally be a stuffy event. The rest of the auction went off without a hitch, with the lily pad making up for the lack of fundraising events during Lily's campaign. Kevin made winning bids on four more cars. After he paid $50 million to score Grease Lightning, which now had incredible sentimental value to him, Jericho leaned over and whispered, Kevin, what are you going to do with all these cars? Kevin looked up at Lily in awe of her selflessness and everything she was willing to give for this charity, including her own safety. I have an idea, Kevin replied. With Lily's duties completed, Kevin found her by the bar where she was helping herself to another Shirley Temple mocktail. You are absolutely incredible. I'm so proud of you, Kevin said, enveloping her in a huge hug. A lot of thanks goes to you, she replied gratefully. Exactly how much did you end up spending? Well, our kids might need to earn scholarships to go to college now, he joked. But I had an idea of how I can put these cars to use. Do you mind if I make an announcement? Not at all, Lily replied, her eyes lighting up. I'm excited to hear it. Kevin went up to the stage and smoothly spoke into the microphone. Excuse me, can I have your attention, please? The crowd paused their conversations and turned to listen. First, I'd like to thank and honor my wife, Lily, for putting on this incredible event and for her tireless efforts to benefit her community. The crowd politely applauded. In the spirit of her philanthropic efforts, I'd like to announce a new initiative for the Lily Pad. All the cars I've purchased tonight will be available as luxury rentals. Anyone will be able to drive these iconic cars around the city where they earn their fame, with all proceeds going to the lily pad. The attendees erupted into applause, and Lily even paused to wipe away a tear. As soon as Kevin left the stage, some of the more generous guests offered to donate their winning cars to the cause. Lily threw her arms around Kevin. I don't know how to thank you she whispered in his ear. Kevin grinned at her with a gleam in his eye. There's no need for you to thank me, but if you insist, let's get back to the hotel and I'm sure I can come up with a few ideas. From the doorway, Atticus watched them, sickened by their lovey-dovey do-gooder behavior. Having refused to suffer the embarrassment of leaving the auction empty-handed, he had tried to seem like he scored a massive victory by winning the love bug, the only car which had no other bidders. Outside, he quickly learned that no luxury car service or even Uber was willing to allow him in their cars in his tarred state. Having no choice but to drive away in his winning love bug, he slammed the creaky door, causing part of the handle to break off. He sat in his car seething. First, his Cleopatra movie at Eminence, then the drag race, then the humiliation at the auction. One way or another... Atticus was determined to get a win over Kevin Williams. He dialed his COO from his cell and, with the malevolent and conspiratorial tone of a general going to war, he directed, Buy me a million shares of Eminence Studios. Lily's charity car auction was an incredible success, with Kevin once again getting the upper hand on rival film financier Atticus Stavel. Atticus was so angered by having been bested by Kevin again that he concocted a new scheme. He ordered one of his underlings to buy up a huge share of Eminem's studio stock. 
Now that the Lily Pads charity auction was in the rearview mirror, Kevin and Lily had other issues to attend to. Kevin still had misgivings about Madame Spatzel's increasing involvement with Sympathy and its unsettling leader, Lance Reeves. Lily, meanwhile, still didn't know what happened to Hazel, the housekeeper at the Beverly Hills Hotel who mysteriously disappeared. Kevin took Lily to celebrate the success of her auction at Soho House, where he was now a member. The receptionist Portobello was far more gracious to Kevin than she was during his first visit. Lovely to see you, Mr. William. Shall I escort you to the lounge? No need, Portobello, Kevin replied cheerfully. We're here to celebrate. We'll see ourselves to the bar. They had no sooner reached the centerpiece of Soho House's main room, the bar that was framed by large glass windows overlooking the glittering city below, than Kevin spotted Lance Reeves at a table with a gaggle of his sympathy flower girls. Kevin was not surprised, but slightly concerned to see Madame Spatzel with them. Kevin, Madame Spatzel called with an enthusiastic wave. Come, join us. Kevin wasn't too excited about the idea of socializing with Lance, but he couldn't turn down Madame Spatzel. He reluctantly guided Lily to the table. Thank you for welcoming us, Madame. Lance, I'd like to introduce my wife, Lily. The mayor of Chicago, Lance said smoothly. He stood up to kiss Lily's hand. I was following your campaign. The work you've done for underprivileged communities is impressive and inspiring. I myself am committed to elevating those in need of a helping hand. Lily quickly recognized Lance's phony charm, but she remained her usual gray self. That's very kind of you to say. Thank you, Lance. Kevin looked around the table for all of Lance's talk about helping up-and-coming artists. Kevin had yet to see any fruits of Lance's supposed labor. Lance's harem of girls, all with dreamy looks in their eyes and all wearing pastel-colored flower crowns, had eerie frozen smiles on their faces. Madame Spatzel was herself widely grinning and wearing a crown of Venus flytraps. It still had her own flair, but she was certainly showing more effort to conform than Kevin had ever seen from her. Land summoned a server to add two seats to their table, and Kevin and Lily reluctantly sat down. It was fate that Ryder auditioned for and was cast in your short film, Kevin, Land said as they settled in. How fortunate we are that he brought such an illustrious couple into our lives, and Madame Spatzel has fit in wonderfully as our newest member. Madame Spatzel smiled while helping herself to a white wine spritzer. Kevin couldn't help but raise his eyebrows at the drink choice. He was used to Madame imbibing the strongest liquor available at any given time. The newest except for that girl Hazel, Madame interjected. Why didn't she come back? Lily's ears perked up at the name. Hazel, did she by any chance work at the Beverly Hills Hotel? We don't know anyone named Hazel, the flower girls creepily responded in unison. Yes, she worked at the hotel and came with us here last time, Madame Spatzel insisted. She said she did improv, which intrigued me because I love to watch people embarrass themselves. You must be mistaken, Madame, Lance said reassuringly. Maybe you're thinking of Cassandra here. You love improv, don't you, Cassandra? I love improv. One of the flower girls responded in a monotone that definitely didn't indicate a talent for improvisation. Madame Spatzel looked confused and chastened. Yes, I must be mistaken. Her deference to Lance was truly beginning to alarm Kevin. Lily clearly felt the same as she turned to him. That reminds me, Kevin. I really wanted to see an improv show before I went back to Chicago. Perhaps we can find one to see tonight. Relieved that Lily had come up with a way for them to make a quick exit, Kevin replied, Absolutely. We probably won't have much time on the rest of the trip, so we should try to do that now. Well, it was a pleasure to meet you all, Lily said while rising. In a creepy unison, the flower girls replied, A pleasure. Pleasure, Madame Spatzel yelled a little late, trying to join in despite meeting Lily for a long time. I'm sure we'll meet again. Lance added in a tone that sounded pleasant yet gave an ominous feeling. 
As Kevin and Lily headed toward the exit, Lance's eyes narrowed as he watched them go. At the receptionist's desk, Kevin asked, Hey, Portobello, any chance you remember a girl named Hazel who came in with Lance's group recently? Oh yeah, Portobello replied casually. I was surprised to see her with them since she seemed a little more lively than their typical vibe. Kevin appreciated Portobello's awareness. She continued, She's also been here with the improv troupe before. The To Be Determined, that's their name. Sort of silly, don't you think? They performed at Sketched Out, a comedy club on Melrose. That's so helpful. Thank you, Portobello, Kevin replied. To Lily, he added, I think we found our plans for tonight. They headed toward the elevator, but Madame Spatzel caught up with them just as the door was closing. I have decided to come with you, she announced. I, too, would like to see the improv people embarrass themselves. Madame Spatzel spoke confidently, but looking at her face, Kevin wondered if part of her maybe also wanted to fact-check Lance's claims. Kevin, Lily, and Madame Spatzel drove ten minutes down Melrose Avenue to a brick building with a neon reading sketched out. On the marquee below, the signage read, Tonight at 7 p.m., the To Be Determined. Does that mean Hazel's troupe is performing? Or that they haven't solidified the schedule yet? Lily wondered. Definitely unclear, Kevin responded. Checking his watch, he added, Either way, they have a show starting in 10 minutes. Let's check it out. They walked over to the front door, which was blocked by a velvet rope and brawny bouncer. Hi there. We'd like tickets to the 7 o'clock show, Kevin said. Name? The bouncer said gruffly. Kevin Williams, he replied. The bouncer quickly glanced at a clipboard before responding. You're not on the list. Kevin was taken aback. They had a guest list for an improv show? Well, how do we get on the list? Kevin asked. You don't. The bouncer replied as he started to scan the crowd for people he thought were more hip than this Dockers-wearing man in front of him. What about me? Madam Spatzel jumped in. I am Madam Spatzel, star of Chains of Desire and my agent assured me I would now be on every list. Not this list, the bouncer replied, seeming irritated. You only get on this list if someone in the show puts you on the list. But my friend is in the show, Madame Spatzel exclaimed. The bouncer looked her over skeptically. Who's your friend? Hazel, she confidently replied. Eyeing Madame Spatzel, the bouncer tapped an earpiece. I have three guests here who say they're friends of Hazel's. After listening for a second, he replied, Madam Spatzel, Kevin Williams, and... He raised his eyebrows at Lily. Lily Williams, she replied. After repeating her name into the earpiece, the bouncer waited. After a moment, he unclipped the velvet rope and reluctantly said, Enjoy the show. Madam Spatzel reveled in her influence while Kevin and Lily glanced at each other. Everything about this was really weird. Things got even weirder once they went upstairs to the performance space and discovered that this apparently exclusive show was so exclusive that they didn't have any audience at all. Madame Spatzel's triumphant face quickly soured. If a VIP crosses a velvet rope and no one is there to see it, are they still better than everyone else? I'm going to the bar, she declared as she spun around to discover space only held a stage and seats. This was truly becoming Madame Spatzel's idea of a horror show. I hate this place, she concluded. We're already here, we might as well see the show, Kevin said in his calming voice. There was definitely something weird going on, and if Hazel was performing, maybe they would finally get some answers. A door opened, and from behind them, Kevin heard a familiar voice. I heard you were here. They all turned and Kevin was shocked to see Ryder, Madame Spatzel's co-star in Chains of Desire, and the one who had brought her into the sympathy group. Something was starting to click together for Kevin. Had Ryder also recruited Hazel into the group? But before he could finish his thought process, Madame Spatzel exclaimed, Ryder! She leapt up from her chair as Ryder purposefully walked over to her with hunger in his eyes. It had been a very eventful day. But still, nothing could have prepared Kevin for the way Ryder grabbed Madame Spatzel's face and engulfed her in a passionate kiss.
Kevin and Lily are concerned both about Madame Spatzel's association with Lance Reeves' sympathy organization and about a seemingly missing member, Hazel, the chambermaid Lily chatted with at the Beverly Hills Hotel. Following leads, Kevin, Lily, and Madame Spatzel go to an empty comedy club where Hazel is supposedly performing, but instead they encounter Ryder, who worries Kevin by kissing Madame Spatzel passionately. Comfortably try to avert their gaze as Madame Spatzel and Ryder sloppily made out like a couple of 1950s teenagers at a drive-in movie. When they finally came up for air, Kevin asked, Wow, are you two dating? Oh, Kevin, Madame Spatzel replied in one of her gushes of misguided wisdom. Magnetic forces of energetic connection between two people cannot be confined to simplistic descriptions like dating. Oh, Ryder responded sheepishly, though with an edge that Kevin sensed was manipulative. I thought we were dating. Madame Spatzel looked torn between discomfort at being pressured into a label and her undeniable infatuation with Ryder. Do not mistake my distaste of labels for indifference, she pleaded. If I died, you would be my first choice to share a joint cemetery plot. That is so sweet, Ryder replied before initiating another intense makeout session. This time, Kevin didn't let them continue indefinitely. He cleared his throat, and when Madame Spatzel and Ryder finally parted, he asked, Isn't there a show starting soon? Ryder looked longingly at Madame Spatzel as he said, all other thoughts left my mind when I saw you. But yes, I should get backstage. I'm excited to see you perform, Madame Spatzel said earnestly. Improv is one of my favorite art forms. Kevin discreetly rolled his eyes, given that less than an hour ago, Madame Spatzel had found improv to be inherently embarrassing. Ryder gave one last loving glance at Madame Spatzel before disappearing behind the curtain. Madame Spatzel turned and sat directly front and center. Kevin looked around at the empty auditorium and reluctantly took a seat in the front row next to Madame Spatzel. This isn't one of those things where they make the audience participate, is it? Lily whispered to Kevin as she sat down next to him. I hope not, Kevin replied. The lights dimmed and Ryder popped out from behind the curtain. Hi, everyone, he projected to the room. Kevin once again glanced around at the empty seats. Ryder continued his speech. Welcome to Sketched Out. We're the To Be Determined. Our name is a work in progress, but your fun tonight is guaranteed. Can someone in the audience start us off by giving us suggestions for a beverage and a famous historical figure? Oh, goodness, Lily muttered as she slid down in her seat but she didn't need to worry as Madame Spatzel was all too eager to grab any available attention. Pilsner and Krampus, she yelled. Even Ryder's easy confidence was knocked off balance by this suggestion. Krampus? Like the German Santa Claus who attacks children? He clarified. That's the one, Madame Spatzel answered. After a short pause, Ryder replied, Great! Three more performers joined Ryder on stage. Two of them sat on the floor and spoke in childlike voices. I can't believe it's Christmas Eve already, began a young woman who looked fresh out of college. The middle-aged man sitting next to her replied, I hope Santa brings me a Game Boy. Breaking character, the girl replied under her breath, What's a Game Boy? Uh, I mean a Tamagotchi, the man corrected himself. The girl continued to stare at him in confusion. That made even less sense. A Nintendo Switch? He added hopefully. Oh yes, a Nintendo Switch, the girl replied, fully resuming her character. The thing that all children born after 2010 want and have heard of. The other performer off to the side with Ryder stepped into the scene. Ho, 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 he yelled. Santa, the two on the ground responded. Merry Christmas, children, the actor playing Santa replied. Look, you've left out cookies and milk for me, my favorite. Now did someone here ask for a Nintendo Switch? Yes, the other actors cheered. As Santa mimed holding out a gift to them, Ryder entered, hunched over, and swatted Santa's hand away. In a creepy high-pitched voice, he said, 
Not so fast. Oh no, it's Krampus, the man playing the brother yelled. That's right. A large man pretending to be a child. Ryder winked at the audience in self-congratulatory acknowledgement of his act of breaking the fourth wall. You have been very bad children. You left cookies and milk for Santa, but not my jalapeno poppers and pilsner. He really hit the emphasis on the last word, encouraging Madame Spatzel to clap enthusiastically. We're sorry, Krampus, the girl replied. It's too late for sorries. Ryder answered, his voice now entirely too dark and menacing for a light-hearted improv show. Bad children must be punished. He then mimes stabbing the children, and Kevin noted that he seemed a little too lost in the character. The other three performers played along, though they were clearly uncomfortable with the turn the scene had taken. Once Ryder grabbed the young woman in a rough embrace and pretended to choke her, she quickly yelled, I guess I'll die now and abruptly dropped to the floor to get out of Ryder's grip. Ryder then turned to the audience with a wide smile and took a bow, prompting his fellow performers to follow suit awkwardly. Madame Spatzel gamely cheered while Kevin and Lily faked as much enthusiasm as they could possibly muster. The next sketch, with a homely-looking yet clearly talented woman at the helm, went much more smoothly with stronger chemistry among the actors. The skit was funny, clever, and light, despite Madame Spatzel's prompts of Red Light District and Quentin Tarantino. When Ryder returned in the next sketch, Kevin and Lily braced themselves for another strange performance. Can someone from the audience provide us with an animal and a favorite meal? Ryder asked. Kevin quickly raised his hand to prevent Madame Spatzel from suggesting anything else that Ryder could spin into a horror show. How about a hamster and Thanksgiving dinner? Great suggestions, Kevin. Ryder laid it on a little thick. He was joined on stage by the actor who had played the young brother in the Krampus sketch. Welcome to my pet store, the other actor announced to Ryder. How can I help you today? I don't think you're a pet store owner. Ryder contradicted him, breaking the first rule of improv. I think you're my son Timmy, and I think we're at this pet store to buy a hamster. The man deflated in response to Ryder hijacking the scene and forcing him to play a child again. Resuming his childlike voice, he glumly replied, Yeah, sure, Dad. Now that we're home with this hamster, Ryder continued giving everyone, including his fellow performer, a jolt with the location change. You have to take care of it. You got it, Dad. The other man half-heartedly replied, clearly resigned to taking the path of least resistance when it came to Ryder. Well, now it's a day later and the hamster has pooped on the floor, Ryder declared. In the audience, Kevin rubbed his temples. Trying to follow this skit was like listening to a vinyl record that kept skipping. Sorry, Dad, the other actor replied at a loss for what to do at this point. You were supposed to take care of the hamster and you didn't. Ryder continued, once again employing a chilling tone that didn't fit the venue. And bad children must be punished. Oh no, not again, Kevin thought. Come here, hamster, Ryder said while pretending to scoop a small object off the ground. He then mimed viciously and repeatedly stabbing it. Please, stop, his scene partner protested, unclear if he was still in character. Don't worry. You'll see him again, Ryder said in a soft voice that was somehow even more disturbing than his monstrous one. He'll make an excellent side dish for our Thanksgiving dinner. Kevin couldn't help himself as he let out a quiet, good lord. Suddenly, the homely-looking woman entered the scene. Thomas, she said in Ryder's direction in a teasing tone, have you been scaring the kids again? What? I... Ryder stammered. Whoever this woman was, Ryder clearly couldn't overwhelm her like the other performers. Timmy, she said reassuringly to the other actor, your father was just tricking you. That animal, your real hamster Krampus is right here, she concluded as she pretended to hand a hamster to the actor. Kevin smirked at the woman's reference to Ryder's other disaster sketch. He couldn't help but be impressed with how she was controlling this one. Despite her dull brown hair and a hooked nose, her charisma and confidence gave her an undeniable shine. Classic dad, the male actor replied while staring daggers at Ryder. 
But honey, Ryder said to the woman through gritted teeth, what about our Thanksgiving dinner? You've already made an incredible side dish for us, she said happily. Clearly this fake hamster will make the perfect stuffing. This got the first genuine laugh out of Kevin and Lily in any skit that Ryder had been in, and they enthusiastically cheered the end of the sketch. Ryder, distraught at having been clearly outclassed by the woman, muttered, We will now have a brief intermission, before quickly shuffling off stage. As the woman was exiting the stage, she removed the mousy brown wig and peeled off the stage makeup that had created the hooked nose. Long blonde hair cascaded down her shoulders and the removal of her makeup revealed her delicate yet striking features that complemented her olive skin tone. Kevin had seen this woman before, nude, in the Beverly Hills Hotel pool early one morning. His eyes went wide as he whispered, It's the lady in the lake. Kevin and Lily learned that Hazel, the missing housekeeper from the Beverly Hills Hotel, had become involved with the sympathy group, though everyone in the group except Madame Spatzel denied it. When Kevin and Lily heard that Hazel was part of an improv troupe, they attended a performance. There, they were surprised to learn Ryder Vance was also in the group, and that he and Madame Spatzel were now dating. Ryder's performance in the show was disturbing, as he turned every sketch into a violent spectacle. There was only one particularly talented performer in the show, and when she removed her wig and makeup, Kevin realized that she was the lady he had seen swimming at the Beverly Hills Hotel pool. It's the lady in the lake, Kevin whispered to himself. What was that? Lily asked. Nothing, Kevin quickly replied. Kevin normally would never lie to Lily, but in this case, he wasn't even sure what he'd be lying about. Changing the subject, he added, Not that I go to a lot of improv shows, but that was really weird, right? I've never seen someone so committed to ending every story by stabbing someone, Lily agreed. Kevin and Lily both looked at Madame Spatzel. They hoped Ryder's performance wasn't an indication of how his love story with Madame Spatzel would end. Madam, what did you think of Ryder's performance? Kevin asked. Madame Spatzel wore a slight scowl. It was concerning, she replied. Oh, Kevin exclaimed, relieved that Madame Spatzel was also disturbed by what she saw. She continued, I always thought he was such a good actor, but his timing? Terrible. Right, Kevin said, not prepared for that to be what Madame Spatzel took issue with. That concerned me, too. Cleopatra needs her Mark Antony, Madame Spatzel replied. Sure, Ryder is very convincing as someone who would die for me, but Cleopatra also needs someone who can make her laugh. Kevin wasn't quite sure that a sense of humor had been a priority for Cleopatra. But if Madame Spatzel was worried about casting Ryder in the film, Kevin wanted to encourage it. I couldn't agree more, he replied. Kevin, Lily leaned in, talking low. I was so caught up in that train wreck that I didn't realize until now. There was no appearance from Hazel. You're right, Kevin replied. Maybe we can ask someone about her after the show. Someone other than Ryder, he added. At that moment, the talented woman whom Kevin had recognized approached them from backstage. It's maybe not the most professional thing to introduce yourself to the audience during the intermission, but I hope you don't mind even though we've got a full house here, she said with a smile, acknowledging the otherwise empty auditorium. I'm Audrey. Lily introduced herself and shook Audrey's hand. Kevin followed suit. You're doing a great job up there, Kevin continued. Lily heartily agreed. Thanks for saying that, Audrey replied confidently but demurely. It's local improv. We do what we can. She turned to Madame Spatzel, who had stayed silent, clearly a little threatened by Kevin's and Lily's praise. Madame Spatzel, she said, it's really an honor to have you here. Madame Spatzel perked up at the recognition. Audrey continued. I've been trying to transition into more dramatic acting, and your performance in Chains of Desire was so inspiring to me. 
I used one of your scenes for my acting class. Madame Spatzel sat up a little straighter. Well, thank you, she replied. It's always nice to meet a fan. Would you want to join us for the next set? Audrey asked. Improv is such a valuable skill it could really take your acting to the next level. You think my acting needs improvement? Madame Spatzel protested, raising her guard once again. I didn't mean to imply that, Audrey replied. She was polite, but not even a little intimidated. You know, Madam Spatzel, Kevin interjected, your natural talent is undeniable, but you're still new to this. Even the greats continue to study and hone their craft. Marilyn Monroe and Leonardo DiCaprio worked with acting coaches well into their careers. Okay, Madam Spatzel said, rising from her seat. I will be like Leonardo DiCaprio. Kevin was surprised that he was her choice between the two, but he was happy to see Madame Spatzel willing to try something new. Excellent, Audrey replied. Let's get you backstage and I'll introduce you to everyone. After they left, Kevin looked around the theater. It was now raining outside, the first time Kevin had seen any kind of weather since arriving in L.A. Along the walls were a mix of photos. Group pictures of troops full of dreamers who all remained anonymous alongside portraits of some of the improv greats that had passed through this venue. Amy Poehler, Eddie Murphy, Ryan Stiles. It occurred to Kevin that around L.A. there were reminders everywhere that in the city of dreams, some came true while others never materialized. So many people were driven to keep going by nothing more than the power of hope and self-belief. Kevin remembered he wasn't so different from them. He was still seeking the upper realm. Like so many chasing their big break in L.A., time and time again he felt like he was closing in, just for his goal to slip out of reach. Kevin was surprised to see new audience members trickling into the auditorium all drenched in rain. Oh yeah, Kevin realized. No one here owns an umbrella or ever checks the weather forecast. What was that falling from the sky? Asked one panicked man to his friend. I don't know, but we should stay here until it's safe to go outside again. The woman with him replied. Kevin took his seat next to Lily and informed her, We're going to have some company for Act 2. More rain-soaked people continued to fill the auditorium, all in various states of confusion or fear about the rain. I think I remember this occasionally happening back when I lived in Wisconsin, one woman said, staring into the distance. Or maybe it was just a dream. The lights dimmed, and Madame Spatzel emerged onto the stage with Audrey. Madame Spatzel was excited to see that she would have a larger audience. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Act Two, Audrey announced. Could someone in the audience start us off with a sport and a vehicle? Football and motorcycle one man called out. Fantastic, thank you, Audrey replied. She turned to Madame Spatzel and said, Excited for the game today? The Cowboys have this one in the bag. Oh, yes, the game, Madame Spatzel replied, unable to stop herself from looking out at the audience. I can't wait to see them kick the ball and score the goals. Audrey's eyes widened, but she quickly adapted. So silly of me. She replied, how could I forget that we're in Europe? In football, here is what silly Americans call soccer. Yes, how foolish of you, Madame Spatzel said at an excessive volume that got a laugh out of an unsuspecting audience. I now have no choice but to drive my motorcycle onto the field and then to the zoo. The zoo comment threw Audrey for a loop, but she stayed on her toes. Just don't leave the field before you complete a bicycle kick. This got a chuckle out from the audience, and Madame Spatzel, making a sincere effort to match Audrey's rhythm, replied, I will take someone's bicycle to do the kick, and then I will kick with my motorcycle, and then I will take an elephant from the zoo and make another kick. It was absolutely absurd and surely nothing that could be mistaken for clever, but Madame Spatzel got the biggest laugh of the night by the grace of pure showmanship and commitment. Sounds like a perfect hat trick, Audrey replied, fittingly wrapping up the scene. The audience applauded while Madame Spatzel took a dramatic bow. 
After Audrey guided her offstage, Kevin was pleased by how energized the crowd was. Madam Spatzel may not have given the most refined performance, but no one could deny she had star power. The rest of Act 2 was a massive improvement over the beginning of the show. Madam Spatzel was a hit in every sketch she appeared in, in spite of, or maybe because of, her complete random line choices and obscure German cultural references that no one else understood. Even Ryan reeled it in from his unhinged performance in the first act. While he clearly had no regard for his fellow performers, he was highly attuned to an audience's response. The show ended, and Madam Spatzel and Audrey were sworn by congratulatory audience members. Kevin noticed he had a voicemail from Olivia Rafferty, his friend, and social media was back in Chicago. Kevin let Lily know he needed to step away. On his way to the lobby, he caught a glimpse of Ryder with the young woman who had appeared in the first sketch with him. She couldn't have been older than 23. Kevin was shocked to see Ryder lean in and kiss her, and though hesitant, the girl eventually obliged. Kevin walked away just as disturbed as he had been by any of Ryder's other performances that night. If Ryder was willing to go behind Madame Spatzel's back a little more than an hour after kissing her when she was merely steps away, how else would he be willing to betray her? Kevin put the thought on hold as he returned Olivia's voicemail. Hey, Olivia, how's it going? Kevin asked. Not well, Olivia responded bluntly. Entertainment Daily got a hold of Margot's student film. They released it. Kevin smacked his forehead. He braced himself for the fallout from Margot's film, which featured an illegal white tiger mauling multiple crew members. How bad is it? He asked Olivia. It's bad, Kevin, Olivia replied. Two animal rights organizations, PETA and the ASPCA, have put aside their long-standing grudge to join forces. They called an emergency meeting, and multiple cat-loving celebrities have released statements condemning Margot. Taylor Swift is involved, Kevin. That's not great, Kevin replied. PETA in the ASPCA we could probably handle, but Taylor Swift can raise an army. Margot's a liability now, Olivia continued. Any project she's affiliated with is going to be targeted by an angry mob. Kevin cringed. Olivia was right. Margot was now poisoned to any project, and that included Cleopatra, the movie on which Kevin's empire now rested. If his entry into Hollywood was a catastrophe, Kevin feared that the scandal could spill over into all of his other business endeavors and ruin his and Lily's reputations forever.